Hey folks, welcome back to my first live stream in a while. Um, I've got lots to get through here, um, so uh, I think this is going to work correctly. If not, please let me know. There's a bit of a lag, I know, because uh, in, in Europe now, YouTube are limiting their stream amounts. Um, so hopefully, you'll see something shortly. I'm waving around. Um, anyway, if you see what I'm saying, see my picture happening, let me know. Write something in the chat window and um, I will crack on. Uh, we've got stacks to get through. Um, as always, I never shortchange you with my live streams. I want to keep things excited and busy. Um, obviously, this time, uh, it's very different circumstances because um, lots of us are uh, in lockdown or quarantined or self-isolating. Um, so that's not ideal. Um, I know it really uh, feels horrible. It feels isolating. It feels, um, you know, it's hard. And um, I hope that uh, if I can run some live streams like this one where folks can just come along and feel normal for a while, just chat about Swift, ask questions, chat in the chat window. I'll build an app at the same time, talk you through what I'm doing. Um, there's lots to get through, but hopefully you might learn a few things here and there. But no matter what, I just hope you feel like you're hanging out with other Swift developers and just chatting, having a nice time. That's my that's my goal, ultimately. While well, also teaching some things along the way, obviously. Um, so my plan is to be here for um, about two hours, uh, hopefully less. But I, I've cleared my diary, right? I'm, I'm happy to stay longer if it helps. Uh, for the next few hours, I am literally here at your service to try and help you folks just feel part of the community again because it's obviously hard to get outside right now. Uh, and I want to say up front, you know, I will not be offended even slightly if you turn the volume most of the way down and leave me just chatting away in the background because you want some coding sounding background noise like you're in office. Whatever works for you, whatever works for you, whatever makes you happy, right? If that makes you calmer and chilled out, great. Enjoy the, the sound of my voice in the background if that makes you happy. Um, I should say I ran a load of streams last year called Swift on Sundays and uh, we had some rules for that and we're going to follow exactly the same rules here. Nothing's changing. Uh, and the rules are things like um, zero harassment. If I see any sort of harassment in the, the chat window, it's an instant ban. Uh, that's how my life works. Um, no well actuallys, no feigning surprise, no backseat driving. Exactly the same thing we had with Swift on Sundays, now just what, Fridays. Swift on Fridays. <laughs> I'm liking lockdown Swift. Try and make it slightly happier if we can, even though it is obviously very terrible indeed. Uh, so today we're going to build a Swift UI app um, because Swift UI is cool and it's great fun. I enjoy it very much. Um, and um, in particular, I want to make something topical because um, as of today, today's my last day when my kids are at school. As of today, for the next probably six months, um, they're going to be at home, certainly five months. Um, they're going to be at home, which is going to be um, great, <laughs> as you might imagine. Um, so um, we're going to be making an app for folks who have kids at home. Because if you have kids yourself, or you have nephews and nieces, or you have grandkids, or whatever, family, friends, whatever it is, they're going to be at home, and their parents are going to be um, slightly more stressed out than usual, I expect. Um, and so uh, the app we're going to make is to help kids who are at home uh, learn or practice addition, you know, mathematics. Uh, and so it's a nice tool you can make for your kids, your grandkids, your nieces and nephews, your friends' kids, whatever it is, to help them do something at home that is vaguely school-like, vaguely productive, using SwiftUI. Uh, and I think you'll actually be really impressed by how much SwiftUI does for us because it makes this whole thing really, really easy. I get through this whole app in easily half an hour if I wanted to. Um, I'll try not to, I'll try and take questions as we go, um, because it'd be nice. Uh, so by all means, go ahead and ask questions. I do want to just chill out and relax a little bit because we are otherwise stuck in our houses and it's nice to chat and hear someone that sounds vaguely normal, like me. <laughs> um, so by all means, um, you can see the chat window in the right hand side of my screen. It's there constantly, I'll be reading it constantly, uh, looking out for folks asking questions. Uh, so by all means, please do ask away. Okay. 
So uh, I'm going to switch across. So uh, Powell asked already, will I post the project code after the live stream? Yes, I will. I will absolutely post the project code after the live stream because um, that's going to be helpful for everyone. Even there isn't a lot of code. I, mean, I looked through afterwards and it was very short actually, but um, even then I'll post the code. Uh, Chris Song, uh, we're doing okay. We're, we're stocked up. We're, um, we've got a, a supply of games to uh, play uh, at home and some school books to follow along with and... Uh, we are as ready as we're ever going to be, quite frankly. So let me switch across to the this thing here. So hopefully that sort of shows you a little me in the corner chatting away to you like that. Let me just bring this up a little bit. There we go. Awesome. Great. Uh, and here's Xcode. Uh, I'm using Xcode 11.3.1, I think, with a regular tool chain. Yes, good. Um, so that's what you need to follow along. It hasn't changed in 5.2, but just so you know, that's where we are. Um, so we're going to build this map uh, app in SwiftUI, but in particular, we're going to be using macOS. And uh, the reason for that is absolutely intentional. Firstly, it makes debugging significantly faster because um, there's no sort of, you know, push the simulator, show you the simulator, yada, yada, yada. It's just there immediately. Uh, and second, it makes keyboard input much easier, even though, yes, I know iOS 13.4 has some lovely new keyboard input APIs for the new fancy pants keyboard. Um, it's not better than 13.3, so it's difficult to use Netscape 11.3. We're going to be using Mac OS as a result. So to start off with, um, you want to go ahead and press create a new Xcode project. And then choose the Mac OS tab and choose app here, then press next. Uh, and obviously choose Swift UI for your UI. Otherwise, this will be an extremely confusing tutorial. And then uh, for the product name, I'm going to call this thing, uh, lowercase, speed math. Uh, now, I should say up front, as a Brit, I really, really want to put an S on there. But I know half my audience is American, so it's speed math. Grr. Anyway, speed math. And then press uh, next and create on your desktop or wherever you like to store your stuff. Okay, I'm gonna make a little bit of space and I'm gonna get rid of the preview window because Mac OS is so quick, you don't really need it very much. I'm even gonna hide this left-hand bar here. Um, so it's basically all code all the time, pretty much. Uh, hopefully that code is big enough that you can all read that comfortably. Uh, it looks good from what I can see on my little stream window. Um, if you want it bigger, let me know. I'll just make it bigger, but for me, it looks about right. So we have this app and it's in a hello world and a uh, infinite size so it will scale the window freely. We don't want that. We want to have a, a, a single mathematics question on the screen. You know, what is 10 plus 5 or whatever it happens to be. Uh, and we're going to represent that single question, a question in our app, using a dedicated view. So I'll say in here that we have struct question row. So one question in our app. And I'll say this conforms to the view protocol. And then inside there, of course, to conform to view, we've got to have var body is some view, like that. And inside there, the body, um, all we're going to do for now is have a little h stack. We'll add more to it shortly, but a little h stack like this. And we'll show a hard coded question, just for now. And it'll change, of course, over time, but uh, it's going to be a hard coded question for now. And we're going to say, a text will be five plus five equals a space. And it's the job to fill in the space. So I'll say text five plus five equals, and then dot padding. And I'm gonna add custom padding here. I'll say I want top padding, and then bottom padding, and dot leading padding. And the reason there's no trailing padding is because well, I'm gonna add their input after that. So they'll type 10, or if they're wrong, you know, 15 or something. Uh, in there. So I don't want to have padding between our question and their answer. Like that. So the H stack and our text with a fixed question and some simple padding. And then after the H stack, I'm going to say I want to have a font. I'm going to do a custom font because Mac OS doesn't have dynamic type. It has uh, the built in Swift UI sizes, but nothing else. In this case, though, we want all our text, all our questions to be neatly lined up not sort of confused and laid out, which you'd get with a natural font. We want monospaced font. So we're going to say, I want the font to be a system font. I'm going to use this uh, down here, the design option. That's where we can say, I want to have monospaced. So I'll say system, 
our size of so system size. Where are you? System size. Come on, system. There we go. This one will do. System size of 48. Regular uh, weight of regular. Design of dot monospaced. So it should mean our text uh, will neatly line up as we want, even though the question different sizes of letters and so forth. So I want that that font. I'm going to use the foreground color of dot white. Now you'll see I'm running Mac OS in dark mode. So white will look good here. If you're running a light mode, it'll look wrong temporarily, um, but it'll be fine later on. We're going to fix this. Um, some folks want a slightly larger font size. So let's do that now. How about that? That's a super chunk. Chunky boy. Uh, there we go. Okay. So that's most of the screen now, I think. Let's make it fractionally bigger. Boom. Okay. I think that's about as, as reasonably large as I can code with, I think, quite frankly. Um, folks want a larger font. Anyway, so if you're using a light theme for your Mac, then you'll see that uh, text is actually very hard to read. That's going to go away as soon as we later on. But for now, it looks great in dark mode, which is what I'm using, which, which is fine. Anyway, um, our next job is to place that inside our content view. We have this text, hello world, right now. We don't want that. We want instead to have a Z stack. So we can layer views one on top of the other. Inside that, we'll have one of our question rows, like that. And then for the Z stack, I'll say this thing here has a fixed frame of width 1,000, height 600. So wide-ish sort of screen, like that. So that gives us exactly one question in a Z stack. So we can add other things around it later on. And a fixed window frame. So if I press uh, something like Command R, it will build and run that program, such as it is. And we should, all being well, when it thinks about it. Go on, Mr. Mac, you can do it. There we go. Right. Hardly an exciting program, but of course, that's just the beginning, right? We'll do much, much more very, very soon. We don't want to say 5 plus 5 equals all the time. We want to have actual maths, right? Otherwise, this is pointless. It's not really much fun game. It's just answering 10 again and again and again. So we're going to do that with a struct to hold our data, our model struct. Now, normally, of course, it put this somewhere else, like you'd have question rows somewhere else, a different file. But I'm trying to keep my window you know, clean. So I'm trying to get rid of this sidebar here. So I'm putting it all in contentview.swift, which isn't great, but there you go. Um, I'll make a new struct here called question to represent exactly one question in our app. So we'll say there's some text, which is a string, which will be uh, 5 plus 5 equals, for example, in our current example. Then we'll say the actual answer will be a string. So the answer will be 10. And it's a string here because it has to rely on user input. So it's a string we're comparing against rather than an integer. And we'll also say there is a user answer which is equal to an empty string. And that's variable. That'll store the answer that they typed in for that question. And now we want these questions to be completely self-contained. So they're going to handle themselves. We haven't got to configure them elsewhere. So we'll make a custom initializer here. And we'll say inside here, pick a random number for the left-hand side of our equation. Let left equals int dot random in. And I'll do 1 through 10. This is easy maths. Of course, you could do much, much larger numbers, but trust me, on a live stream doing maths, I'll just look stupid as you freeze up. So let let equals int dot random in one through ten. And the same for right. Let right equals int dot random in one through ten. Like that. So we've got left number five, right number three. We can now use that to set our text property. We can say text is equal to string interpolation left plus right equals like that so that's the question we're going to ask users to answer in our program and the actual answer the one they have to actually guess is going to be actual answer the string form of left plus right and again that's a string because we're handling user input it'll be given to us as a string to be shown on the screen it strings the entire time you could use integers but trust me strings are a bit easier so that's our question struct. That's our data model we want to work with to make questions in our program. Our next job is to uh, make an array of these questions inside our content view. So down here. So the actual questions we're going to be asking users and what the answer should be and what they've typed for those answers. So I'll say 
This is at state. It'll be modified over time. Private var questions equals an array of question. An empty array of questions. So it'll be no nothing to start with, which is fine. But as soon as the app runs, we want to create some questions. We want to create 20, 30, 50, 100 questions. You could add a, an intro screen to make that more customizable if you want. Um, so we have this questions array. And what we want to do is, when the app starts, we want to call a method called create questions that will fill that array with actual question instances. Now remember, our question struct knows how to create itself. It'll do random numbers automatically and create a text for it automatically. And so uh, here we can just say, create a new question 50 times, and it will fill the array with random questions for us to show in our maths quiz. So I'll say for underscore in one through 50, questions dot append a new question and that will make 50 random questions for us to show and of course that should be run as soon as the app launches so we'll say after our frame dot on appear perform create questions so call that create questions array immediate uh, method immediately as soon as the app launches so we can start uh the game basically kick it off so now we have at this point, nothing's really changed. We've got all the back-end code behind it. We still have this single hard-coded question row being placed. We don't want that anymore. We want many question rows to be placed. So I'll say for each zero up to less than questions.count id.self index in and then use that with our question row. Now if I run the code, this will look identical. Oops, did I make a mistake? Uh, questions, sorry, quick questions. There we go. Run the code, it'll look the same because it's making now 50 of these question rows, all with hard coded values, all in the Z stack, all layered on top of each other. So there's nothing else you can see here. We don't really want that, of course. We want them to be placed uh, further down the screen so you can actually see the questions you're answering and what you've answered already, and, and yada, yada, yada. And so we can do that by going back to our Xcode window again and adding a modifier to question row. We can say this thing where it essentially should be offset on the X left and right zero easy on the Y though we want to take our index that is value coming in from the for each the position in the array and we we'll use that we'll say take a CG float of our index and multiply it by a hundred and so each item will move further and further and further down as we're going through the loop. Ali Pacman says, why doesn't my Xcode throw errors after each line of typing? Um, because I find that deeply irritating while I'm doing videos and it's quite off-putting for watchers as well. And so in Xcode's preferences uh, in general, you can turn off show live issues uh, and that is off for me most of the time, which is why I make method errors like that. I should have called create questions and I didn't by accident. Um, but it, it makes it easy to follow when I'm doing live, uh, when I'm doing recorded videos, because otherwise it's just full of red halfway through I'm explaining something, which is very off-putting. Anyway, this will now offset our um, questions for each one in the loop. And so if I press Command R again, it should look fractionally better. Boom. So they're now scrolling off the screen nicely. Uh, question here. Uh, what is a V stack or scroll view instead of a Z stack? It'll become really, really clear why it's super fast. Uh, and again, a list. So a lists and scroll views are great. We want to have these things. I don't want users to scroll through these things. I want them to have to be looking at the current one. It'll make much more sense when you see the app actually live and running. But I want to control the one that's in the middle of the screen, the one that's answering right now. Uh, Carlos is asking, explain ID self. So um, when you make any dynamic views, with Swift UI, like if I had for each here, uh, it doesn't know how many items will be in there and how they're going to change. So it wants to know how it can identify each object inside the loop, what makes it unique inside the loop. And this is problematic because it's a view. How can we identify a view? So it has to know what makes each one of our question rows unique. And the answer is this index value, this value coming in. 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, whatever it is inside our loop. 0 through 50 right now is what we're looking at. So we're saying that number 
the self number 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 50, what it happens to be, is the unique identifier inside the loop. There's nothing else magic about this, nothing else we can identify by. We're counting from 0 to 50. That number is unique identifier. Now, usually with for each, you can just do that and say for each 0 to questions.count, and that's fine. But what will happen here is we make our array as empty. This code will execute. Then we call on a peer perform create questions. And that will modify the array. And so um, this will cause a problem that we're changing the size of questions.count during our programs run. And by default, for reasons known only to the Swift UI developers, uh, for each zero to questions.count does not have a unique identifier. You've got to do it by hand if you're going to change that array over time. So you've got to have that for this particular example because it will change over time. So now our questions are scrolling off the screen. They're well, not scrolling, but they're positioned off the screen as you can see. They're moving down, down, down. I can't get to them. You can't scroll around here. It doesn't work. Um, they're just off the screen, which is great. That's what you want at this point. Trust me, it'll make sense. Um, but what you really now want to do is show the actual questions inside there, not 5 plus 5 equals again and again and again, but the actual question the user is answering. Um, Kerry J asks, can I make this an iOS app if we haven't got Catalina? Of course you can. Of course you can. This Swift UI code almost entirely is the same on macOS and iOS. The only part that's different is uh, we'll be handling uh, key presses the macOS way. And uh, in iOS, there's actually a new API, like I said at the beginning, for handling um, key presses. And I've got an article on it somewhere. I'll try and link it to you. There we go. This is for iOS 13.4 only here. Um, this one. Uh, it's presses began. And it works very, very similarly um, to what we're using in AppKit. But it's not actually exposed in SwiftUI yet. So you've got to do the same sort of workarounds we're doing for macOS anyway. I'll paste into the chat window so you can see that. There we go. Okay. So, uh, yes, by all means, do an iOS port if you want to. It's really not that hard to do. Anyway. Questions. Right. So, we're going to, to get rid of the hard coding of questions. We don't want that anymore. We're going to go up here and say that rather than having a hard coded question, I want to have a property for my view being passed in of the current question it is showing. So, I'll say var question is a question like that. And now we can pass that in when we create our question. So I'll say uh, down here we have a question row. I'll say question row question is self.questions at index. So as we loop over the array, show the correct question for that question row. And now rather than saying five plus five equals all the time, we can just say text of question dot text. So it'll show whatever random question we made inside that question struct. So I'll press command R again. Boom. So now you're seeing one plus nine, 10 plus four, three plus eight, seven plus one, and so forth. So it's all there for us to work with. Oh, there's some echo. Oh. Cool. What's that going? Well, nothing's changed on my side. I'm going to unplug my microphone. This might go hideously wrong. Oh, I'll write the chat window. Come on, I can't type. Yeah, I get it. The sound's echoing. Relax. Here we go. So I have now unplugged and replugged my microphone. Is that any better? Let's find out. Uh, it's not bandwidth on my side. I can see I'm still streaming at full speed. It's better now. <laughs> yeah? Better? Happy now? Good sound? <laughs> okay, awesome. Good. Okay. If it happens again, let me know, and I'll just try and fix it again. 
Good. Thank you. I understand. It's all good. You can stop typing now. It's good. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Very good. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Anyway, so we now. I know. Stop. 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 Stop typing. Stop. Stop it. I can see. Good. Okay. So <laughs> we have our questions now appearing, which is a big improvement. It's it's not uh, broken anymore. Okay. So. The next step is uh, we want to show users where they should answer. If I run it again, you'll notice that it's, it's, a, it's a gap, really. You can see 10 plus 1 equals what? A big blank space. And we don't want that. We want a nice big box here they can type into, have some visual feedback on um, where they're typing and what it should be. And so we can do that up here. We have our H stack, the left-hand side of our question, 5 plus 5 equals... And this right-hand side, I want to put in place. <laughs> thank you for that, Raj. <laughs> um, I want to put in place a um, another stack because I want to show uh, a, a box for typing plus the actual answer. So I'll say there is a Z stack here, and the reason for the Z stack is because I want to get this exactly right. So I'll say this Z stack has some text, which is an empty string with a space in, just a space, nothing else, just some white space, uh, with some padding like that, and a fixed frame of nice and wide, 150. And then I'll overlay this with, and then in, boom, overlay this thing with a rounded rectangle and a corner radius of 10 points and fill it with a color blue, like that. Then after that text, I'll say text of question dot answer, like that. So I'll run it again so you can see how it looks and then I'll show you, uh, I'll walk you through why it's doing what it's doing. So I'll press command R, oops, question dot, oops, user answer. Like this. Okay, so that's what we're seeing now. This nice big blue rectangle, rounded rectangle, showing them uh, where the answer is going to be, or you know what they typed already. That's the goal for that that box over there. Now I want to explain why we have all that code because it really does matter. Um, this whole thing, this whole stack here, next to the text is itself inside a H stack. And that H stack has our monospaced size 48 regular font attached to it, which means everything inside there is given that font. And so when I have a text with a space in, or any character really, SwiftUI will make sure that that text has the same font as the question before it. So that space, even though it's obviously empty for us, will have the same height as the rest of the font. So it'll automatically match it. So you can see it matches that whole area quite nicely with obviously some padding. So it matches that same size nicely. So if we change this to be, you know, 36 or 72, or whatever, that box would change to the right size at the same time. So it keeps it neatly spaced out, neatly to matching our font size. That's why I have an empty space here. We then say some padding, so it's a bit bigger than the font needs to be, and give it a fixed width. Now, the reason for the fixed width is important because if we saw uh, a single digit answer or a double digit answer, they'd have different widths. So by having a fle flexible width, we're actually giving users a, a bit of a, a guess as to what the answer might be, but also making our UI look a bit irregular. It isn't flowing um, so smoothly. By having a fixed width, it will eventually be one nice, clear, straight line. As for the overlay, the overlay, oh no, yeah, so we could do background as well, but overlay I use here, personally, we don't want the text ever be visible. You could have something else there. You could have the actual answer there behind there, for example. So I tend to put things over it rather than under it. Um, but the overlay will automatically match the size of the thing it overlays. And so the text is an empty space with a frame of 150. The rounded rectangle will also be 150 uh, wide by the same height as the text. So it'll automatically make sure that round rectangle completely covers the text below it, which is exactly what we want here. Then after that, we're going to write the user's answer, 
which is by default an empty string, which is why in our code you see nothing here at all. But once we add keyboard support, which is imminently, we'll start showing the user's answer above that blue box so they can see what they've typed to, you know, 2 plus 4. Even I can do that one live, but 2 plus 4 will be in there as well, shown above that blue rectangle. So, this is kind of coming together. It's a bit, bit wonky here, but we'll fix that. Don't worry, I'll, I'll get onto that for sure. First things first, though, I want to handle keyboard input. This is a really important feature for this application because you're typing your numbers. So we're going to handle the values 1 uh, through 0, so 0 through 9, sorry, and return to handle submitting answers, but also backspace to handle deleting answers. So we can do uh, the full set of input you need to handle these questions. Now, SwiftUI doesn't handle uh, key presses well. In fact, like at all, it just doesn't do it. It's really quite bad in that respect. Um, so we've got to use some app kit. We've got to drop down to a little tiny bit of app kit and the, I've, I've made it as small as possible. I'm going to do a little tiny bit of app kit and just basically punt it over to SwiftUI to handle the rest. Um, I haven't got a Mac Pro Muaz, I've got a MacBook Pro and it's a 16 inch, which is maxed out. It's an absolutely uh, amazing uh, laptop. Anyway. Uh, we're going to do a tiny, tiny, tiny amount of app kit to, to bridge the gap that we can't currently do in SwiftUI. So um, we're going to make a new uh, NS window subclass called Typing Window. Now this is actually is actually best done using a new file because it's one tiny change, and we'll let uh, Xcode do that for us. So choose Coco class and subclass of NS Window, and I'll call this thing Typing Window. Uh, Maid asks, why not use a text field? Because it doesn't look nowhere near as good. <laughs> you know, it looks nowhere near as good. Anyway, typing window. In speed math, in speed math, create. It's going to be super, super small, right? First off, we're going to say there are three things we care about. And we're going to use notifications to say, hey, this thing happened. Because SwiftUI can read notifications and AppKit can read key presses. So we're going to bridge those two using notifications. So I'm going to say as an extension on notification.name. And I'll define three of these uh, ex uh, notifications I want to send. I'll say static let enter number when I've typed a number 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 7, 8, 9, or 0 equals notification.name with enter number like that. Then we'll do one for remove number. They've pressed backspace. Notification.name remove number. And then static let submit number equals notification.name submit answer. So three notifications we can see send across the board to uh, transmit entering, removing, or submitting our answers. Some questions. Austin Cullen asks, do I think much of AppKit's functionality will be port to SwiftUI? Yes, I hope so. I expect the vast majority, they might kill off a few old things. I don't mean cells, I mean sort of newer than that, but still old things they don't care about anymore. But yeah, broadly, um, they're going to port all across all being well. Clickbait King, can't I use custom text field style? I could, but again, it won't look anywhere near as good. Trust me, you're going to be blown away by how easy this is. You're like, wow, that's why text fields weren't used, because it's going to look fantastic, trust me. Anyway, those are the three notifications we want to send. And inside our typing window here, we're going to input, uh, implement just one method, which is key down. When a key was pressed on the screen, what do we want to do? And all we're going to do is read the key code and send it out. Make it really, really simple. We'll say, if the event has the key code of 51, then that's a backspace key. Notification center dot default dot post. And we're going to use the name of dot remove number and the object of nil. So if they've gone back, they've pressed backspace somehow, transmit remove number over to SwiftUI, which we're watching for this, and then uh, move on, uh, which sends a submit answer. Oh, yeah, sorry, you're, you're right, sorry. Submit answer. Thank you very much, Axel. Boom, submit answer. So we have that, so just go ahead and send that out straight away. Else if the event has the key code of uh, 36, that's a return key 
being pressed. Then we'll say notification center dot default, uh, default dot post, the name of enter number uh, and the object of nil. So if press return, submit their answer. Thank you. <laughs> it was that. Yes, several of you. Sleepy for president. Patrick, thank you. Alexandra, Bill, thank you very much. It is definitely equals equals. And then if we're still here, the only other thing we care about is a number being typed. Um, so what we'll do is we're going to read the characters that were pressed. We'll say else guard let characters equals event dot characters else return. So read the character they pressed. And we only want to accept numbers here. It'll be a string shortly. But for now, we want to just filter on numbers. Uh, Moe941, if you want a job now, use uh, UIKit. If you're just having fun, use SwiftUI. I could say that a thousand times. I'd love to say it a thousand times more. That's all my advice I have to give on that one. <laughs> it's so much fun. Anyway, we're going to say if the number is an int of characters, which means if we manage to convert the text input into a number, then we'll post that across using our enter number. So we'll say notification center dot default dot post name of enter number object number. Paul submit. I made a mistake somewhere. Ah, submit, submit. Thank you very much. Submit number. Ah, submit answer. Yeah, you're right. Thank you very much. That's what you're all trying to tell me. Submit answer. <laughs> there we go. Submit answer. To remove number, you press backspace. Submit answer, you pressed enter. Otherwise, for all numbers that are pressed, enter number. And if you get to here, it's anything else. You've pressed Q, T, R, P, whatever it happens to be. Um, anything else, we just don't care. It'll just basically swallow that type uh, key press entirely and move on. So Swift UI just doesn't care at that point. And so now what we want to do is use that window for our Swift UI view. So that's hosting Swift UI for us. And in app kit land, that's in app delegate.swift, you'll see we have window equals an NS window. We want to have window is a typing window. So that will use our typing thing there at that point. And uh, hopefully that'll build. Yeah, okay. So we have numbers being deleted, remove number. Submitting the answer, submit answer, typing numbers, enter number with a typing window and we're done. So that kind of is all the app kit bridging we have to handle realistically. App kit we're now done with, we're now booked back in Swift UI land uh, and we'll move on. Um, Patrick asks for constants. So this is actually based on a really old Mac keyboard spec, these numbers. And there are actually equivalents for them, but they're not very useful. <laughs> you can do NS backspace character, for example. But that maps to 0x0008, um, which is not the key press character. The key code and the ASCII character are two different things, unhelpfully. Um, so watch out for that. That will trip you up. Um, Kevin asks, will it prevent other methods as command Q? I don't think so. Let's find out. Let's press command Q now. I run it again. Nothing's changed really. Command Q. Yeah, it's fine. Yeah, it's great. Anyway, so that's our app kit done. We're going to do no more app kit. Like at least it'll very, 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 very end. <laughs> so we're going to come to view now. I'll hide this left bar again. So we're back to full screen code again. Uh, okay, Moaz, you've asked that many, many times. Inset, I, I, I'm guessing you mean on a CG rect, brings in the frame size by a certain amount of pixels on each of your points, sorry, on each side. That's all it does. It's very, very useful for handling things like that. Um, uh, Bill asks, what do I do in App Delegate? In App Delegate, by default, we get an NS window, this thing here. We want a typing window, our new subclass of NS window, not a regular NS window, like that. Anyway, back to SwiftUI. Over here in our content view. We now have AppKit posting notifications to us saying what's happening, why, when, and so forth. It's now the job of SwiftUI to watch for those uh, as a publisher. 
to say when this has been pressed, when they've deleted a number, when they've pressed a number, when they've hit enter, do something special. And in Swift UI, we do that with the on receive modifier. So I have in my content view a frame, and on appear, I'm going to say on receive. And let's accept some sort of publisher from combine. And I'll say notification center dot default default dot publisher for dot enter number. So when they've entered a number, what should we do? So I'll read in the notification object, note in, and I'll just for now, first make sure we have an actual integer here, because it, it, it ought to be, but you never know. Guard let number equals note dot object as question mark int else return. So if somehow we got anything else than a number through here, just bail out. Otherwise, I will print out the number that was received. Anestis asks, uh, how do you use typing window for an iOS app? What's the equivalent? There isn't an equivalent, but if you scroll up, you will see I linked to an article on my site about the new iOS 13.4 support for keyboard presses being read in UI view controllers. And that's more or less how you do it. You wouldn't have a hosting controller, have a custom hosting controller, which caught the key presses and passed them on somewhere else. Anyway, so when it ends a number, just print it out. Then we'll say, I'll uh, just copy, copy and paste a little bit because otherwise it's a lot of code, uh, paste and paste. We'll say publisher for remove number. And then inside there, we'll do underscore in, print remove. And the third one we'll do publisher for submit answer. Oops, answer. Again, underscore in, and then print submit. So it's a simple, handful of methods here and it's very angry because I've made a typo somewhere on receive oh yeah I need to have a double double parens here like that boom um, so a simple bit of code here to make sure that AppKit is sending us data and SwiftUI is receiving the data it should print the number or print remove or print submit and nothing else no other keys should be read let's find out if I've screwed this up so down here we should see Yep, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, zero, then return, then backspace, and then if I tap the keyboard, nothing else happens. So that is working very nicely. Yeah, awesome. So we're now getting key presses read through the system and being uh, ready to put into Swift UI. Now for the interesting part, we want to put that actually on the screen. We want to show what they typed for their current answer. Now this requires us to know what is the current answer because we've got loads of answers. Now we know it's the zeroth one, then it's the first one, second one, third one, fourth one. But we have to track that in some state in SwiftUI so we can modify the correct thing. So I'll say up here in our content view, there's a new property called at state private var number equals zero. So that's the question number they're answering right now. And so down here, where we have our print number, we want to use this place to say, modify the number they're actually working with, the question they're working with. But we don't want them to type very long numbers. You know, what we're doing up to, I think the highest that we can have is 20 in our sums, but let's go up to say 999. Everything beyond that won't fit our little blue rectangle. So we're gonna cap our number at exactly three digits. So we'll say inside the publisher for enter number, if self.questions of self.number read the current one we're looking at, dot user answer, dot count is less than three. So if their current answer is less than three letters, three numbers, then we'll add to that the new number. So we'll say self dot questions, self dot number, dot user answer, plus equals the string of the number they typed, like that. Boom. So we have here, add their number they typed to the user's answer. So now if I press this back, we should see some sort of progress. Let's find out. So I'll type one, two, three, look at that. I'll type four, five, six, nothing happens because of course we've capped it at three digits. 
So that goes to one, two, three and stays there forevermore, which is great. So that's worked very nicely. You can see now why we haven't got text fields. It looks much, much nicer when we type it directly into the box they're working with. The next step really is to make sure the enter key works, so the return key, sorry, works. When we submit answers, right now it just prints the word submit. We don't want that. We want to say, was that the right answer or not? And move on to the next question. Uh, right, hello, Pratik. I'm just gonna go ahead and put you in timeout. I have no patience for folks wasting time. Good luck with that. Anyway, when they submit the answer down here in the publisher for submit answer, they press the uh, return key. We're gonna go ahead and consider that their final answer. And to do that, it's actually really, really easy in SwiftUI. This is absolutely beautiful. I'll say, if self.questions, self.number, dot user answer is empty, is false. So if they've typed something for the current question, then self.number, so self.number plus equals one. Start answering the next question, but only if they've typed something. They can't press return to skip questions. You've got to type something and then continue. Run the app again. I'll say one, two, three, enter, four, five, six, enter, seven, eight, nine, enter, and so forth. So you can see it's actually kind of coming together a little bit. But the important change you want to make to really show users the question they're answering right now is up here in our offset. This is where we position our question rows down the screen. We're gonna modify this to take into account the question number they're on right now. So they'll move up and move up and move up as they type answers. So I'll say it's CG float index times 100 minus CG float of self dot number my, uh, times 100, like that. Let's remove, oops, I think that one there. Hello, Sophia, I'm gonna put you on timeout as well. I haven't got patience for that either. Boom. So it's gonna position them off screen nicely, but then also adjust that offset as we type stuff. So we press enter, number goes up, it'll move up and up and up the screen. So I'll press command R again to try us out. So I'll press one, two, three, next, four, five, six, next, seven, eight, nine, next, and so forth. Now a Swift UI, a feature I love so much is we can just scroll down here and say, I want to have with animation uh, that. Ponderasi suggests changing number to question this current question. You're absolutely correct. You are absolutely correct. Number's a terrible property name. I ended up using number because in my test run, the font size was so big that lines like this became awfully hard to read with longer property names. I did think about it. Of course, I think it's a good idea to use longer, more sensible property names. It just made it more hard to read in this kind of code. So yes, it was intentional having a slightly shorter um, property name. Anyway, we've now got a with animation block where we modify the number. If I run it again, this will look much nicer. So we have uh, 15 here. Look at that. It just slides up like that as we type. Exactly right. There's no scroll view, no list, nothing like that. They're always answering the current question. It's much, much clearer. This app, I think, is starting to come together quite nicely. Now, before I continue, I just want to say, uh, obviously, I, I'm doing these videos. I want you folks to feel welcomed and encouraged and not alone in these very, very difficult times. Um, I don't charge any money for them. Of course, they're free of charge. It would be helpful if you could at least leave a like on the video. If this video is helping you, hit that like button because it helps other folks discover the video. It makes YouTube want to recommend it to more folks. So please take a moment to hit the like button. It does mean a lot to me because it helps me reach a, a larger audience with these free videos. End of advert. <laughs> anyway, let's continue onwards. So what we want to do is uh, next um, modify the way these, these, these um, rectangles look. Because right now it's a big wall of blue. It's not immediately obvious which one you're answering. And um, that isn't great because we want to be really, really clear to users which one they're on 
Is it the current one, the before, an upcoming one? If it was a, an answered one already, was it right or was it wrong? We want to give some more feedback, not just, not, not just a wall of, of blue rectangles. So to do that, we're going to say that our app has uh, three possible positions. Uh, <laughs> thank you, King. Very kind of you. Um, has three positions for its questions, which is going to be, it's either going to be answered, it's already been and gone, uh, it's a current, it's happening right now, so the question answering right now, or it's upcoming, it's coming soon, below the questions. So I'll say back in our code again, where we go, here we go. I'll say that we have an enum call position, case answered, current, and upcoming. Boom. So those are the three possible states uh, a question can be in our app. It's either already been and gone, it's being answered right now, or it is about to be answered soon. And now we can store that inside our question row. We can say this thing has a question that's being answered, but also it knows its position in the pack. It knows if it's current or answered or um, upcoming. Uh, Nico van Linden asked for the on receive code again. Let's put it down here. There we go. There's your on receive code. So it's three of these publishers for the three um, notifications we're sending. Enter, remove, and submit. Move that way. Talking. Uh, yes. Sorry, Axel. But if I'm going too quickly, please say just slow down or ask a, a very hard question, and I'll answer it while you're reading the code. <laughs> anyway. Uh, so our Question rows now have positions attached to them. Are they head or behind, or whatever? And this takes a bit of thinking because we want to have, you know, as much logic as you can should be outside of your view body if possible. Oh, Esther, that's very kind. Thank you so much. I do have a bag of dog treats here, by the way. If the if the dogs do wander by later on, I've got a fresh bag of treats for them. We've stocked up specially in case we go into full lockdown here, which we are not currently, but you never know in the future, sadly, at this point. Uh, anyway, so, yes, positions, that's where I was <laughs> before the dogs came along. Right, so we have our create questions method. Then we'll say func position for index int, and it'll return position. And its job is to say, um, I am question three. Have I been answered already? Am I currently answered or am I upcoming? Uh, uh, sorry, Daryl, I don't understand your question there, Daryl, sorry. I'm, I am trying my best, but if you can be more specific, I'll, I'll do my best. Anyway, so this will say, hey, here's question number one, question number 10, or whatever. Um, Chris wants to see the enum, which is up here. Boom. Position. Where in the question deck am I? So our position for method will be said, told, here's question number 10. Have you been answered already? Are you the current question? Or are you upcoming? So it's the job of this enum to, or that method to return one of those three enum cases for a given index. So I'll say down here, uh, if index is less than our current number, our current question number, return answered. It's already been answered, been and gone. Else if index is equal to our number, then it's our current question. I return dot current. Else, all other options here return dot upcoming. It has not been answered yet. Yes, I'll try and hide the app window, Daryl, uh, and focus on the code when I'm talking. It'd make more sense, I think. You're right. <laughs> anyway, so now we can say for any given question number in our for each loop, is this before, current, or upcoming? And that's done up here when we make our question row. It makes some space on my screen, perhaps. There we go. Our question rows here. We pass in the current question that's being looked at. I'll also say its position is equal to self dot position for its index. So it'll be told your before, your answer, your current, whatever, right? So now each question row in our view knows exactly where it is relative to all the other question rows we have. And we can use that to fill in our blue rectangle. Because right now, if you remember, we have 
uh, this thing has blue rectangles everywhere for all questions. It looks very hard to follow what's going on. We don't want that. We want to have instead different kinds of color. Uh, so I will go up to our question row again here and add a new property. I'll call this thing position color, a Swift UI color. And now we'll say if position is answered, then stuff, else if position is uh, upcoming, then other stuff, otherwise return blue. So the current blue will be used for the current question. Otherwise, we'll fill in these two with different kinds of colors. For upcoming questions, I'm going to return, return color dot black dot opacity 0.5. So it'll show a little bit of the background through, like a darkened background on that hotspot for upcoming questions. For the answered option, this is more complex because it's either going to be green or it's going to be red if they were right or wrong. So in here we'll say if question, whoops, lowercase, if question dot actual answer is equal to question dot user answer, if they were correct, awesome. I'll return color dot green. I found through pure trial and error that a little bit of opacity brings it down um, in brightness. It's not quite so harsh here. And then else return color dot red dot opacity for 0.8. Multiple folks asking why not you switch case? By all means, you switch case. Honestly, it's fine. It makes no difference. Many folks want to know. There's no real difference. Of course, use switch case. That makes you happy. It's fractionally longer, but whatever makes you happy. Anyway, so this question row now knows how to color its rectangle. So here, it'll be green and red if they're right or wrong for answered questions. It'll be transparentish, translucent, black uh, for upcoming questions and blue for the current question. And with that in place, we can now actually use that for our fill down here. We have color blue. I'll say color, position color, position, come on, position color. Any mistake somewhere? Mm, nope, it's happy. Great, okay. I run the code again. Boom. So it's now really, really clear which question we're answering. That one right there. If I say six, that's the correct answer, it should go green. It's a beautiful color animation as it happens. I'll say six plus eight is zero, clearly wrong. I'll go red. Again, animating smoothly from blue to red. All thanks to that with animation block, moving up, causing that fade to happen. It looks really, really nice. So, this app's really coming together, great. But there are still some finishing touches we want to do. And there aren't many of them, but you can see immediately, this kind of thing really annoys me. Um, it is here. Uh, this is a, a two digit number here and a single digits here. And it's nudged it in. It looks wonky. Uh, isn't very nice to read on your eyes. It doesn't flow smoothly from top to bottom. And it could do uh, much better than that, quite frankly. And the easiest approach to this is to effectively pad things out because we have a monospace font, a fixed width font for the letters. So if we add spaces where we need to, it'll make all our numbers add up beautifully no matter how big they fit on the screen. And a trivial way of doing that, really, really easy way, is to go into our question here and say there's a property called padding amount equals zero. Don't pad this thing at all. Don't pad this thing whatsoever. Uh, and when we're calculating the numbers to add, left and right here, we'll say if left is less than 10, padding amount uh, plus equals one. If left, if not, if let, if let, there we go. Boom. And then if right is less than 10, padding amount plus equals one. So for one plus one, there'll be padding amount of two, for 5 plus 10, the padding amount of 1, and 10 plus 10, it'll be padding amount of 0. So we know how much to pad our answers so they stay neatly aligned in theory. 
So to do that, we can now just modify our question row so it adds as much space as needed when doing its drawing calculations. So I've got our code again. Here is our uh, question row. We have this question text right now. I'm going to scrap that and replace it with another h stack. A h stack with no spacing. And inside there, if the question has a padding amount property greater than zero, then we'll do a text using string repeating an empty string by count question dot padding amount. So add as many spaces as we need to make our number work out. And then after that, text question dot text again. After the h stack, that same padding we had before, which was padding uh, top, top, uh, bottom and leading, whoops, leading, boom. Uh, Jin Park asks, what at number 100? As someone's answered for you that, yes, you're correct, they are capped at a certain number of values, only one through 10 right now. If you want to have 100 or 1,000, then you calculate padding amount based on the count of a string form of the integer. That's the easy way of doing it, like that. Okay, hopefully that alone should make our numbers line up nicely. So I'll just do one, 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 one. There we go, see that? Look at that. Neat alignment, always beautifully right aligned here. Boom. Just by adding a spacer here, that's all, all we're doing. Uh, so Mark, you could do spaces, but then you've got to figure out how big the font's going to be, or what a spacer means with no fixed size for Mac OS, because it's of course dynamic spacing and so forth. Um, so spaces are more complicated and they don't adapt to font sizes and such. So we don't want that. So that's our first little fix. It's a nice little tweak to make the whole thing work better. Uh, the second option we want to do is make this thing uh, visible in light mode. Because right now we have uh, typed in this white text on a dark background. But the white text we asked for, the dark background comes from Mac OS, because we're in dark mode. And in light mode, the white text will remain there but now it'll have a very light background. So that it'll be visible, just about, just about. We don't want that. Or much clearer. Uh, Axel, your list shouldn't scroll with user input. It should scroll based on code input, because we modified our offset to say uh, minus CG float self at number times 100. So factor that in a number value into the offset, so it moves up and up and up and up over time, like that. Um, so, we're going to make this thing visible for light mode users. And actually, this is why we have the Z stack here in the first place in content view, because we can add more things in there if we wanted to. But an easy, easy fix here is after the frame, just give our Z stack a background. So I'll say this thing has a background view. I'll use a linear gradient. Boom. And the gradient's going to be the colors of dot blue and dot black, start point I'll do top leading, end point bottom trailing, boom. So we should get a nice um, blue to black gradient behind our questions, making sure they remain visible as we go, like that, awesome. Um, could you use alignment gu guides rather than spaces? Of course you can, alignment guides are really, really powerful things for making layouts that line up neatly outside of a single Z stack or H stack or V stack, or whatever. Um, but they are more work, <laughs> they're significantly more work. And that is the simplest approach to solving it. And it works great and it looks great too. So yeah, anyway, we now have a background that so works in light mode and dark mode. Uh, now for a, a critical part, we actually have to show a score to show users how well they're doing um, in, the, in the app, because right now they don't know how they're doing across all 50 answers. Uh, and so this requires a little bit of code. We're going to say in our content view, there's a new property called score, which is an int. And this thing is going to calculate the total score. And this is not terribly hard to do. I'll do it in a nice long way, but there are short ways of doing it. You say var total is zero. And then for i in uh, zero up to less than number, if questions i dot user answer is equal to questions i dot actual answer 
then total plus equals one. And finally, return total. So we'll go through all the questions they've answered so far, add one to it if it's correct, otherwise do nothing, and then send that back as a score, like that. So now we have to uh, add our score somewhere, and as Aurelien's correctly predicted, this is why we have a z-stack to begin with, because we want to have our score visible uh, next to the other stuff. So we have our uh, for each here, uh, so I'll say below that there is a v-stack, that's going to contain our score. Now you want to think about it, we want to be in the top right corner. So I want to say the V stack for the whole screen, and inside that H stack for the whole screen, and use spaces to push it to the top right corner. For you top right, presumably you're looking the other way around. Anyway, so a V stack here, then a H stack, then a spacer inside the H stack that's so pushed to the right hand side of the H stack. And I'll say the text is score of score like that. And I use a bit of a padding, a bit of padding there, and then it scroll down just slightly. I'll say there's a background of a capsule, which is going to be filled with uh, color dot white, a little bit of opacity again, I'll put in, boom, like that. Uh, and then I'm going to use dot animation nil, which means do not animate this text changing because SwiftUI will attempt to animate it as the score changes, and you'll see the numbers sort of clip sometimes because um, the numbers are different size. It's not a monospaced font here, it's a regular sized font. Uh, and so by disabling animation for this, the score will just snap up immediately, which is what you want, really. Uh, so that's our spacer and our text. Uh, for the h-stack, I'll say there's a font of large title, and then a foreground color of dot black, and a little bit of padding, boom. And then after the h-stack, a spacer, like that. And finally, some more padding. Love me some padding. So, more or less, that should get somewhere we want. Let's find out. Yeah, up there, floating away. Um, great. Uh, Alejo shouldn't score be a state var. No, it doesn't need to be. It's re it's re invoked every time uh, bodies re read, which is every time the answer's changing. So that's fine. Aurelian, yes, you could use alignment if you wanted to. It's fine. Uh, any more questions? Uh, MacBook Air. Yeah. MacBook Pro is very very nice. Very noisy. I'm not sure you can hear my fan, but it's blasting out in full speed right now. I actually bought a little. Um, I'm not sure where it is. Lost it already, great, in the chaos of my house right now with the kids coming home. Oh, it's, oh I've lost it. Anyway, uh, an actual uh, table for the laptop to sit on with fans built into the little table. Um, so yeah, it's pretty uh, intense. Anyway, so now if I answer 17, scores now 1, I'll answer 12, scores now 2, I'll answer 12 again, 2, 11, and so forth, 5, and if I get it wrong, it doesn't move. It's exactly as you'd expect. So that's our score working nicely. Great. Um, next up, if I say, eight plus one, and I hit eight by accident, I meant nine, I press backspace, it's printing out remove, remove, remove down here, but it isn't actually removing the number from here, because it still has print, not a actual number in there. So the next little fix we're gonna make is to actually let this thing delete numbers when they press backspace, because we're very generous like that. So in our code, we have all these on receive things here. Here's the thing doing remove being printed out. Uh, I'll say instead, underscore equals self dot questions self dot number dot user answer dot pop last remove the last thing they typed um, Philip Lazov how did I learn about capsule um, honestly if you look at Swift UI by example on my website I document all these shapes and so much more it is the I think the largest single free documentation there is in Swift UI anyway so now that's made removing work so I can press command R again and the question's going to be uh, 10 plus 8. I'm going to say 17, then backspace, awesome, 18, done. So that works nicely as we now correct ourselves perfectly. And for the final little tweak, um, it's back in AppKit land again, but it's so, so small. I want to add a little title to this title bar up here. So it says speed math, tiny bit of branding. That is an app delegate. Here's where our window's made. I'm going to say somewhere in here, window dot title equals 
speed math. Boom. Just so we get a little bit of um, branding at the top here. Can I score the color settings of squares? Yes, color settings of squares. There you go. So it's green, red, or black with some opacity. It's unfair that not all people have the liberty to ask questions. Anyone can ask questions. Go ahead and ask questions, Infinity Phoenix. I'm doing my best to answer them. There are lots and lots of folks watching this right now. It's very hard to answer them all. I'm doing my best. By all means, ask, ask away and I'll do my best. Uh, and, and that's it. That's as far as I'm going to take it today. That's an hour and a quarter-ish of, of coding. Um, but I do have some simple, simple homework for you to try and take this further. No, Stephen, there's, uh, that's the homework. Get ahead of yourself there. Um, so the homework, uh, there's, there are so many ways you can take this app further to do, do more interesting things. At the very least, if I enter lots and lots and lots and lots of ones, lots of ones, boom, all the way down. How many questions are there? Boom. One for the last one. I'm on the final question now. Nothing happens. If I press two, bang, crash. So this, of course, goes beyond our array now. So homework number one, at the very least, think of a way to reject that final answer. You can't answer question 51 that isn't one. Of course, the real goal there is to have a game over screen saying, you've won, your results, your score, whatever, like that. Uh, and not very hard to do, but it's two small changes that make it much, much better. From there, I'd say the next step would be to make a timer. I actually did this in my... Uh, Swift on Sundays uh, switcheroo episode. We did one with a timer in Swift UI, counting down from 100 seconds to zero, um, and you, just, you can copy and paste that code. It's really, really easy to do. And then finally, if you want to take this app to the very, very limit, I would suggest a menu screen asking users, you know, do you want easy, medium, hard? You know, is it one to 10, one to 100, one to 1,000? And should it include plus, uh, minus multiplies as well. So you can add a menu to it to take this thing much, much further. And it's so easy to do these things. Because all you have to do is, do is go to your question uh, uh, up here, and when it's multiply, you just put in a multiply symbol, which is a, actually an emoji. You're just looking for multiply. Uh, there you go. And then just put in answer is that times that. And that's multiply done right there. It's really, really easy to do. Um, so you can make this app into a multiply, subtract, um, add, whatever you want to, very, very easily with a menu screen giving users more options. And that way it'll work for, you know, at this age, it's for my six-year-old daughter doing adding and stuff. Um, but with multiplication, it could work for any age of children because you can do, you know, 18 times 19. That's quite a hard sum for any age of kids. Anyway, that is the project I have for you today. I think it's small, it's simple, it's it's fun. Swift UI makes it really, really nice. You can see with the sort of glorious, smooth color animations and stuff, changing colors is really, really nice. It makes it great in Swift UI. It feels great. You can put that on iOS very easily. There are so many ways to get advanced to make it further and further and further. And most importantly, it's deeply topical because so many folks are gonna be at home with kids for the next many, many months. My kids are basically off school now till summer, which is an <laughs> absolute joy. Uh, and so they're home till September. So this kind of thing can give me 20 minutes a day of peace and quiet. <laughs> and so I recommend you try it out. Ask your friends, ask your family, ask your kids and your grandkids. They'd love to have this. It gives them some heads peace now and then. Anyway, so that's my app for you. I've given you lots of homework to go and try out. I'm gonna hang around. If you have questions for me about the application we made, about Swift UI, about anything else. This is your chance to uh, ask away. Alejo Acosta asks, how is the forum going? Am I gonna send more invites? Um, there are no invites needed. You can just go ahead and join the forum now. If you go to hackingwithswift.com slash forums, or if you go to the main website, actually, you'll see the link straight away. So here's the main website. Uh, there we go. You'll see a big forum button here. Press that, and boom, you're into the forums. So yeah, go and use that. Yeah, solving answers, brilliant. Love it. So no invites required. You can go to the forums today and sign up. 
Oh hey, and if you haven't liked the video yet, please like the video. It makes a lot of difference to me. Helps folks discover the video more easily. Go and like the video at the very least. I'm looking hard here. Um, Bruno says, bring the doggies. <laughs> you want the doggies? Um, I, can, I can encourage my wife to send them up and I'm sure they'd be keen to come um, because I have dog treats. Um, sadly though, as folks who came to my Swift on Sundays should know, they only get one dog treat per super chat. And I think only Esther had a super chat. And so they get one dog treat. That's like half a treat between two dogs. And they're quite big dogs. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, that's not going very far for those dogs. Anyway, Alejo meant testers. Okay, fine. Well, it's live. There's no testing required. It's all live. <laughs> so go and check it out there. Um, Jin Park, um, which book would be the crest crate best one for a beginner to learn Crate ML? Oh, that is covered in Advanced iOS Volume 3, if I remember correctly. Um, because um, uh, I did it again in Volume 2, but that was Core ML. And I think in Volume 3, we really went to town with um, Create ML. We did, I think, three different things with it, I forget. But it was quite fun. We really noodled around with it because it's lots of fun. Um, so, yeah, I suggest um, that one. Um, Toanuk. Have I ever thought to develop an app for coronavirus? I have an idea for you. Um, I think developing an app for the virus is a bad idea. I don't think the virus has got an iPhone. Um, but if you mean to help with coronavirus, um, no, I haven't thought about that. Um, so I would say that um, Apple actually have placed restrictions there now around who can ship apps for coronavirus. Because um, obviously lots of folks want to get in on the action. Uh, and some have dubious goals put it that way uh, and so Apple now restrict who can ship coronavirus related apps uh, and I think it's basically known healthcare providers or scientific institutes and so forth so I could not ship a coronavirus app at this time because Apple does not allow it it's that simple so yeah by all means make one um, uh, but shipping it would be hard any plans on starting SwiftUI on Sundays? Oh, hi. Hi, Lamin. How are you doing? Um, no. <laughs> no plans for that. So I, last year, I ran a series of live streams called Swift on Sundays, which is every Sunday at 10 a.m. Pacific time. Uh, and we did 20 episodes over the year. And um, I think for folks watching it, it might look easy doing a live stream, but it takes quite a bit of prep, a bit of planning, a lot around me, a lot of clutter all around me, um, and it's pretty intense. Uh, and running 20 last year was intense, so I'm trying to take it easy this year, uh, do different things. I would say particularly for folks who follow me on Twitter, um, please, please be considerate. My kids are now at home almost certainly until September, and my first priority is absolutely and always to my children and my wife, um, and so I'll be spending less time doing Swift stuff, more time herding my kids. And uh, that's just a fact of life. So please be considerate. I know you want new books, you want new videos, you want new live streams, you want stuff, 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 stuff. Of course you do. I'm doing my best, but I'm also working under fairly constrained circumstances at this time. So please just uh, give me a break. <laughs> be considerate. Give me, give me time. Um, ah, Thomas, thank you very much. Um, do I cover Sprite Kit in my books? I've got a whole book on Sprite Kit. It's called Dive into Sprite Kit. And it is awesome. It's an awesome book. It's the only one I ever made which follows um, a, a choose your own adventure style. It literally says to you, we're going to make this game. Um, should it be about A, B, or C? And when you choose something, it adapts the rest of the book based on what you chose. All the code changes to match what you chose. And as you work through every chapter, you get, you know, two or three more questions. Should you control with the accelerometer? Should you control with touch controls, whatever? And the rest of the book changes to match your choice. So you can go through the same project two, three times and make something completely different every time. And there are four projects in the book. So there's, I have, I have I calculated somewhere how many thousands of combinations there were, but there are many thousands of combinations of projects you can make with that one single book. It's called Dive into Sprite Kit, and it's great fun. It's the only one I've, I've seen, I think, in the world that has that adaptive programming approach where your choices literally matter. It's cool. I loved it. It was great fun to make. <sighs> um, BM, I guess, is that Benji? 
Um, when will the next Swift over coffee be released? We recorded it last week and um, we should have released it this week, but I've been doing so many other things. Um, again, uh, my life isn't going to plan right now, like most of the planet isn't really going to plan right now. I had in nine days been planning to fly to Disney World for three weeks of holiday with my kids. That is, of course, very much cancelled. So I spent this week on the phone to British Airways, to Disney World, to Universal Studios and so forth, Airbnb, trying to get refunds on the tickets and so forth. It's been a real joy this week. It's been so much fun. But also I've been, I've been editing all those videos from last year I, I should have made for the last 25-ish um, days of the Swift UI course. They're almost finished now. So I've got that to do, I've got the Swift, uh, other coffee stuff to do, I've got the cancellation stuff to do, I've been in the forums as well. It is frantic right now. Um, so yeah, <laughs> really, really busy. And what I, you haven't seen yet is, um, look, I, I know right now, it, you know, it really sucks, right? Out there is a wall of sadness and anxiety and actual genuine suffering. Uh, and I'm doing my best to alleviate that by having live streams, by putting the forum up there. Uh, I'm just doing my best to help folks, you know, communicate and, and not feel alone. And um, one of the things I'm trying to do is have an April Fool's joke or two because I know they're annoying sometimes, but right now I just want folks to smile a little bit. I, I know it's horrible. I know it's painful. I know it's... A lot of stress out there right now. Trust me, I'm feeling it and my kids are asking me every day what's going on. It is painful and it is hard. Um, but um, if I can make folks laugh for a few minutes, 10 minutes, 20 minutes, just forget about 2020 temporarily, um, I'd like to. So I'm working on what I hope are some good April Fool's jokes due out in 10 or 11 days or so. Um, so watch for that as well. So I'm doing that as well. And <laughs> so, so much work going on right now that you can't see. Oh, goodness me. I'm doing so much work right now. <sighs> anyway, that was a long rant to a very simple question. I apologize. Uh, three weeks in Disney World, scary. So it wasn't three weeks in Disney World. It was, it was like two weeks in Disney World and then a week in Universal. We'd booked, we'd booked the, um, Kennedy Space Center astronaut training experience with me and my 10 year old daughter. Um, we had to plan to do all these great things and of course it all fell through and it's going to cost us a lot of money. So yeah, it's, it's my life right now. It's very difficult right now and it's not just me, it's difficult for everyone right now. So yeah, it's great. <sighs> Questions. Key presses not being responded to, breakpoints in key down aren't being hit ideas. I would suggest, Patrick, that your mistake uh, based on that limited paragraph of text was in your app delegate not having a typing window here, but having an NS window instead. Change that line to be a typing window or an NS window, and that should spring it to life. Jonathan asks, about my site, which framework do I use and what tools do I use? It is entirely PHP and MySQL running on Linux and Apache. Um, it handles a lot. I mean, my site handles a heck of a lot of data. I'll give you a little glimpse of um, the scale my site runs at because it is pretty immense. Um, I switched to Cloudflare um, when? Three weeks ago. Uh, and you can see the scale it works to is just phenomenal. This poor, poor website is just uh, harsh. So here we go. If I bring this window over here, I'm just checking, I think nothing dodgy in there, is there? No, that's all good. Here's my Cloudflare status update for my site right now. Boom. So you can see it went live here, 22nd of February on Cloudflare, and it kind of peaked around 24th and became the same from there. In less than a month, since, what, 24th of February today, it's served up almost half a million visitors, 25 million requests, almost a terabyte of data being served up. Um, it works to a huge, huge scale. Uh, and for me, that means using time-tested, proven tools that are going to work well. Um, so yeah, there's there's lots of uh, lots of data being thrown through that site, and actually the servers are remarkable. The servers are a very powerful server, but it, it runs at very very low load levels almost all the time because my, my code's very efficient. Clearly, anyway, 
let's put that away. Right. Uh, um, da -da -da -da. Do I think they'll do Swift UI Evolution? No, I really wish they'd done small iterations of Swift UI. They haven't done. And that's very annoying. Um, so yeah, that isn't great. Bruno, Animal Crossing Horizons or Doom Eternal? One second, Bruno. One second. Oh. <laughs> there was only really ever going to be one answer to that question. <laughs> Only ever one answer. Um, yeah. Animal Crossing is the answer if you weren't sure. <laughs> anyway. Um, next up. What do we have after that? Uh, duh, 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 duh. Best practice to store user token and user object from a login response. Call it user defaults. Uh, I'd use neither of those things, Stan. Um, I'd put it into the keychain so it's more secure. Um, because tokens are... Effectively user logins. So you uh yeah, you want to keep those safe if possible. Uh Yixi says, Did I build the site myself? Yes, it's all built on me. No Swift. All PHP. Uh how do I track updates my book? So yeah, there are user dates basically. What you'll see is the next set of EPUBs that go out have dates in the EPUB. And um, you'll see from that date, it'll match your uh, Gumroad date or similar. If it's out of date, then of course, update your book. That's been in the PDFs for a while, but it's only now going to appear in the EPUBs as of like the next update, basically. Um, Aurelia likes, yes, good. I'm glad to hear you land on my site a lot. That's good for me. It means I'm writing the, writing the right stuff. All I ever do, like my entire business model, as it were, is... Write down what I'm doing right now. Write down what I care about right now and trust that I'm not alone. <laughs> that's it, that's my entire model. Here's what I'm doing right now. This is super cool, I love this. Oh, wow. And I write about that thing, put out there, and fortunately, so far, the rest of the world are doing very similar things. So I'm glad that it's working very well. Uh, have I experimented with Redux with SwiftUI? No, I have not. Joel, could I show how to make a map which you create events shared with Firebase? You're basically saying, could I make a custom app for you? Um, so no is the answer. I won't do that. Um, by all means, do it yourself or pay someone to do it for you. Um, um, Lelen or Ilelen, um, do I plan to make 100 days of Surfside Swift sometime in the future? No, I really don't. Um, I know the 100 days curriculums are very popular. I know folks love them. And I love them too. They're a great way to get into a topic. And they're free. I want, I want folks to access this learning if they're rich or poor, whatever. They can get in this on ramp to their career. So they can reach their goals. That's my goal. And I know they're good and folks love them, but don't underestimate how extremely hard they are to make. A hundred days of tutorials, projects, explanations, videos, and more is extremely intense. Plus backed up by the challenges and those tests I make. Um, so there's lots and lots and lots to do. So um, no, I don't plan to do another 100 Swift on server side Swift at this time. Even I <laughs> have, 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 I haven't got time for that in my life. Particularly with my kids at home, remember, my kids are at home. Um, Crispy asks for the content view window where the score is displayed on the screen. So let's have a look. Uh, content view down here. There's the score being shown. Boom. Joel, I don't mean to dis disrespect you, but you're asking me to make a custom app just for you, and I'm not going to do that. I haven't got time for that. That suits exactly one person. You can piece it together yourself. I've made tutorials on Swift UIs and maps before. Look at that. Learn from that. Then find a fiber tutorial. Learn from that. And then put two and two together and make it yourself. I cannot make custom app requests in a live stream. That's extremely hard to do. Um, best practice display a thousand-ish 
integer variables on a view for iPad? I, Bryce, that's a very broad question. I don't know. Um, how about making videos on testing? I have a book on testing, a very good book on testing, uh, and it's very popular. It's one of the most popular I've ever written, actually, called Testing Swift. Um, so I recommend you f try that and see what you think of that. Fernando, thoughts on Flutter? I have no thoughts on Flutter. I just don't care. I have it, it has no interest for me whatsoever. Is there any app I developed that shows me how to open an app like Google Maps inside my own app? To do that, you want to use um, uh, application links. So apps can register their own URL schemes uh, and Google Maps might be one of them. I expect it is probably. Uh, and you can just say Google Maps colon slash slash where it happens to be and then your address to point to uh, probably work. They use a site, or there used to be a site, which was full of all known URL schemes from apps. You can add your own there very easily uh, and that might work well. Uh, what's the best way to convert the current app to a DMG file? You know, I don't, re I don't recall. Um, it's been a long time since I did DMGs, like a long time. I barely even remember the last DMG I made. So I don't recall, I'm afraid, sorry. Chin Park, I have no idea how TensorFlow will come to CoreML. That is a question for Google or Chris Latner. Not even Chris Latner, he's left Google now, hasn't he? Someone else, Dave Abrams, he works at Google. Ask him. Chris Song, uh, any tips on applying to jobs like on resume or cover letter? I have a whole article of um, job stuff. Um, if you go to the site and then um, here, go to careers, um, you're looking really for start here. This is the, the, the career guide. And um, there's a, a skill review full of all my tests and glossaries and quick videos and catch up stuff and knowledge base and yada, yada, yada. Then all my coding tests in one place. Then all my interview questions in one place. Then core things to talk about, like modern Swift or refactoring or formatting Swift Lint or Fastlane or GitHub or CircleCI, refactoring, interview questions. Then career advice and how to get a job as an IS developer. I think it's particularly the one you're thinking about. And one here for interviews. Um, so there's so much uh, advice on that one page. You just go to careers, start here, and it's kind of packed in one place all at once. Hopefully that's useful for you. Chris. Patrick asks, are there SwiftUI based Mac apps released out there that are good examples of real world SwiftUI? I have no idea. I, I don't track released apps terribly well, I'm afraid. I don't think you can search for SwiftUI in the app store to see them. Um, so I don't really know, I'm afraid. Uh, Yixi, what's testing like in SwiftUI? It's really bad. Um, and this year, of course, I hope for UI text view and UI collection view to land in SwiftUI. I want that kind of nice stuff, but I really, really want, I really, really want the testing team, Brian's team, to do something amazing with testing because there is no need, realistically, to run the app to do testing. You know, when you do something like um, React on the web, like the original React from Facebook, you can create a virtual DOM, render your React app inside the virtual DOM, make changes over time, you know, input and output and so forth, and then read inside the DOM, look at a certain thing. Um, Darren wants to see line 20 to 30, 20 to 30. There you go. So you can basically say, render my code, make changes to it, you know, call methods, whatever. What is this? What's the content of this paragraph right here? Or what does this link point to whatever in the web? And, um, SwiftUI should be able to do that. I should have to press Command R to launch my app in the simulator and navigate to screen to screen to screen to screen to screen to, screen to, to test stuff. That's doing UI testing, which is slow and a bit flaky sometimes in iOS. I would much rather say, render it to a virtual test thing, evaluate its, its, um, its layout hierarchy now, and check that this screen is showing or check this text field is showing, whatever it happens to be. I hope that happens. Now that's a lot of work. That's a lot of work for a very small team. They're a tiny team, testing team. Um, but they hired, they hired um, Shevsky. Shevsky joined them recently. Um, so maybe he's keen and excited to do this kind of thing with SwiftUI. So I hope so, because it'd be really, really nice. That would transform SwiftUI testing. Um, so right now, there isn't much. 
Um, the key is, as with so many things in UI kit as well, get your logic out of your views. You know, you see um, when I had this uh, position four index thing, you could have done that right inside the body if you wanted to, of course you could, but it's much nicer to get it out of there so we can now test that. We can write here's index zero, uh, what's the position for that? And it'll, it'll know at a glance what the input and output should be. So it's much more testable. Um, for example, here we have our uh, offset. This thing could easily be taken out, offset for question row, for example, so that we can test that. Here's index zero, what's its offset? And it'll tell us, and that's a much, much nicer way of working than having it in the, the view. Just like UI kit, by the way, this is not new. It's a long standing problem. Get out of your views and put it somewhere else. A long answer. Uh, Taylor, is there a Ray Wendelik app for Mac OS now? I thought it was, I thought it was only for iOS. Um, anyway. Chris, I'm really glad you're finding it useful. And there are lots of other folks out there doing amazing work. Um, John Sundell's one of them. Antoine Mandeli, who was around earlier, is one of them. Um, uh, Sean, Sean Allen's doing uh, astonishing work. Uh, Donny, Donny's a, a fairly recent writer. He's doing wonderful work in our community. Um, so there are lots of folks out there all trying to contribute to fill gaps and encourage and build up and support folks who want to ship apps with SwiftUI. I'm just glad to be part of it. I'm glad to be here. Uh, Turkey, I have no idea what Google may or may not use in Android in the future. I genuinely have no interest. Sorry. Uh, any news from Apple about any changes to SwiftUI? No, but let's face it. Um, in June, when DubDub happens online, it's going to change dramatically. Uh, hopefully, it'll be additive. Um, I suspect there'll be a few breaking changes. Uh, I'd like to see, I don't think it's going to happen, but I'd like to see for each going away, this struct here. I'd like to see an actual for in loop from Swift there. That'd be really, really nice um, if they can pull it off. That's a language change, that one, so that could be hard to do. We'll see. Um, Issa, I'm afraid I don't know the answer to that question. Hi, search while I'm scrolling. I'm not sure. They haven't really exposed that in, in SwiftUI yet, which is a real shame. Perhaps in, in June. Um, Philip, will they ever open source SwiftUI like they did with Swift? So, years ago, like quite a few years ago now, eight years ago now, wow. Anyway, a while, a while ago now, I worked for a Linux magazine doing writing about Linux full time. So open source was in my head all the time. Open source, open source, open source. I used to really fight for the GPL, but that's a side issue. And I remember talking to, um, was it MySQL? I forget it was. They'd, they'd open source MySQL itself, but not one of the tools. And they were thinking about how to open source that. And they were pretty clear that releasing the code, just putting the code out there, open sourcing the code is the easy part. Anyone can open source code. Just take your code, put it on GitHub, done, right? Um, and that's easy. The hard part then is managing the project because now folks want to be involved. They want to file issues. They want to do their own pull requests. They want to fix typos, add features, whatever, 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 whatever. And that takes a lot of work. And you look at the complexities around Swift Evolution, if you follow it, there are massive discussions with members from the core team talking regularly, uh, trying to provide feedback along the way and guidance. And of course, they actually meet regularly the core team to discuss actual proposals. Will it be approved or not? And it's a lot of work. And that's just for the language, never mind the iOS, macOS, tvOS, watchOS side of it. So I think folks imagine that Apple is going to flick a switch and open source with UI. They can't. There's a lot of work behind that to maintain it and support it in the long term. So um, I personally have no interest in seeing it open source. I couldn't care less. I just couldn't care less. If they do it, great. But I don't for a second uh, overestimate how much work that is because I know it's a lot of work. Uh, Jin Park, have you ever been to Dub Dub? I have. I was there last year, the year before, um, previously. It's great fun. I love Dub Dub. I'm so sad this year that Dub Dub isn't happening. And honestly, if Apple said, listen, just come and, come and fly out, come to some of the events. There's no sessions, there's no labs, but just come and go to the cool events and hang out with your friends. I would probably still go. 
if I could, of course, because of course I can't currently fly to the US. I'm banned from the US thanks to the um, flight restrictions. Because um, it's so much fun. I mean, even going to um, B Bums, Bill Gum Bum Gardener's um, core sushi event is so much fun. I meet my friends. I know half of these people, and, and they're lovely people. And we hang out. We have coffee. We have dinner. We just do stuff. And I only see them once a year. Um, and the same is true for other Bay Area companies in the area. They only see these folks once a year. And to not see them for a, another year is genuinely sad for me. So it would take such a little, little, little thing for me to actually want to fly out to San Jose this year, even though WW itself is online. Hey, Apple, just go and invite me out. I'd happily, happily, happily go and just hang out with you for a week. Anyway, that's my long, long, long answer to a very, very, very short question. Uh, I'm glad you enjoyed it and yes they are indeed very hard and particularly right now my kids are my number one priority love Swift love my kids more you want some tips to improve programming logic especially in Swift uh, I've got a whole book on that it's called Swift Design Patterns it's very good I love that book uh, it's the most personal book I've ever written because I'm drawing on my own experiences here is what I've done in the past when I applied this pattern, here's where it went wrong. Here's where it went right. Here's what I used instead and so forth. So I'm giving you, yes, the most important design patterns, I think, for Swift developers, but also practicalities of this is where it fails for me. This is where it succeeds for me. This is where I went wrong in the past and and more. So uh, it was pretty, uh, it's a good book. I really like it because it's not just dry technical topics. It's not like I haven't like just printed the Gang of Four in Swift, for example. Um... Bryce McCann, do I have a beginner video for dealing with documents in iOS? I do. I did that in Swift UI. Um, not Swift UI. In Swift on Sundays. What was it called? It was called Just Type. Just Type. It's one of the free uh, Swift on Sundays videos you can get on my YouTube channel. Um, so go and check that out. Um, Shingetsu88. Uh, no, I don't use Redux. I can't do that, I'm afraid. Rayflex, yes, the source code for this will be online at some point in the future, hopefully soon. Um, any tips doing Swift UI previews? Um, not really. I've, I've got a very, very, very fast Mac, so when I press Command R, it basically runs it almost immediately, so um, it's not really a concern for me. I don't tend to use the previews very much. I have to use them when I'm doing my videos, otherwise folks complain. Why don't you use previews? Um, so I have to use them then, otherwise I just I just don't. Um, Lamin, what's your story on being so generous doing the work you do for free? <laughs> uh, nice question, thank you very much. Um, look, at some point I have to earn some money, okay? This is my full-time job. I have to feed my kids, you know? I have to pay for my cancelled Disney World tickets, for example. Um, I have to earn some money, okay, at some point. I have to sell some books and whatever. Um, and actually, I really appreciate folks who subscribe to my Patreon channel because they support me every month to create free videos like this one. And I am just so grateful for that because it means I haven't got to worry about um, selling books, writing books all the time. And it's actually here on the website, the Gold Supporters page. And everyone gets their name on this page. Uh, and there are more anonymous ones as well. And actually, at the end of every page, I actually have print someone's name every time. So you can just click it to find out more about that if you want to check it out on every page in the footer. Um, and now it's Philip, and now it's Zachary, and now it's um, Victor. So, yeah. So the, the, the folks who support me on Patreon are so helpful because I'm not constantly worrying about, oh, no, I've got to, I'm running a lot of money. I better write another book. These folks give me a constant income, which is amazing because it means I can focus more on doing free stuff. Because that's what I want to do. I recognize that, you know, I'm, I'm extremely privileged to live in you know, a, a fairly rich country, um, to have had a, enough money to buy my MacBook Pro and all my stuff. Many folks don't. And the cost of entry is so high for iOS development. You know, buying a MacBook Pro or even an, even an iMac or a, a Mac Mini is not cheap. So I want folks to be able to reach their goals and build stuff with Swift and have fun with Swift UI and similar no matter where they come from. And if they haven't got the money to buy books, I still want to help them. So I do as much as I can for free. Like last year, everything I wrote or recorded was available free. My conference last year, 
um, all the money we made was given away to charity. Um, a charity do wonderful work for disabled children over there. I'll get, I'll get emotional if I talk about it too much. Um, they're a great charity doing wonderful work. I was actually sponsoring my own diversity tickets, my own inclusivity tickets for folks who couldn't afford to go to conferences. Uh, and because I can. And yes, at some point I've got to release a, a book or whatever, a video course to try and earn some money because <laughs> um, I have to pay for my, my kids and, and my car and, and my life and stuff. But uh, last year I was able to get by a whole year without doing that. This year, yes, okay, I have to actually earn some money at some point. I'll probably release some, some new books or something. But right now, at least certainly last year, I was able to get the whole year by without earning anything, which is great. So thanks to Patreon, which is amazing. It's really, really kind. And you support it too. Thank you so much. Lamin, thank you so much. It's very kind. It makes a huge difference. It really does. Because I can focus on just doing stuff for free and giving away stuff for free. As opposed to thinking, oh man, I'm, 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 I'm poor. There you go. You're right there. Check it out. Boom. Thank you very much. Oops. There we go. Anyway, that's my, that's my story as it were. Any more questions? Uh, 90 days Swift UI. Well, the 100 days is very good. Use the 100 days. This one. It's great. Uh, and it's long and complete and packed with tests and projects and milestones and, and more. And a final exam. Uh, and like I said, there's a, a whole bunch of videos going to ship for that um, next week, I hope. We'll see. Because they're already edited now. Just got to get them online. Even that takes a long time. <sighs> questions how to properly manage oops gone away rats go back how to properly manage loading error states in swift ui so um for that one what i do is break out my views into small chunks as small as possibly can so there'll be a loading view an error view and a main content view all wrapped up inside a parent view which switches between those based on the correct current program state. That's the easiest way of doing it. Don't try and clutter up your main one view with all possible states. Have small views for each of the states and switch between them. Better idea. Um, Jason asks, have I thought about putting out a book on core data? Um, no, I haven't, because most folks want fairly simple stuff. They want easy core data. And a handful of folks want more advanced core data, but the vast majority want, give me my data, sort my data, filter my data, put it on the screen, and that's it. And that is, you can teach that in, in, in an hour or two. It's actually in the 100 Days Swift UI. One of these projects uh, uses core data. Uh, it's in um, the original Hacking with Swift book, Hacking with iOS now it's called. It's in there, core data's in there as well. And we cover all those basics right in there. So the need for a more advanced book is fairly slim, so I'm not planning that. What I would say is I've almost finished my next book. Again, <laughs> it's free because I'm a mug apparently. <laughs> No, I like giving away stuff for you when I can. So it's a free book, um, and that should hopefully be online April, maybe. But it's going to complement the 100 Days of Swift. Um, it'll the, These opening days that are very intense, very hard, it's going to complement those days to make them easier to understand. That's the goal. Uh, next up. Oh, cracky, so many questions here. Um, group on Telegram. I have forums. They're here. Go to the forums. Our question is there. I also have a Slack workspace. Um, it is here. Join Slack. Use one of those two, please. I'm not going to go any further and have more segments. Uh, they're both good. Uh, Winston asks, how I thought about doing a subscription service for premium tutorials. Um, I get asked that so much. And yes, of course I have. This is a short answer. Of course I have. I, I, I wanted to make sure I had a really good, broad coverage of free stuff first so that folks can, can 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 learn ios make a career for themselves get a great job and progress for free and i think now i'm almost there like where i want my free content to be i've got a massive youtube library i've got the huge example code uh collection and knowledge base i've got so by example just again massive collection of, of answers I've got the 200 days curriculums. I've got my amazing iOS app. I've got playgrounds and stuff. I'm almost there with what I think my free content should look like. And it's huge. You've seen my numbers. They're just, they're just through the roof, right? Um, so I think I'm almost where I want to be to start doing subscription-based stuff. Uh, and this will be more advanced. So advanced Swift UI, advanced Swift, 
and beyond, you know, really pushing the boundaries of what Spotify I can do, for example, would be a subscription stuff. I'll just do regular videos that way. So yes, it's on the cards. I do want to do it at some point, but I want to make sure I've really nailed my free offering first so that folks can benefit no matter where they are or what their income level is like. Um, ah, great. Sorry, my wife texted me. She got me some milkshake, apparently. <laughs> Thank you for that, says my wife. Great. Anyway, questions. <laughs> so many questions. Crikey. Um... I've lost track of even where I was. Uh, right. Bryce asks again, do I make more from books and training or from actual app development? So I don't charge for training. I don't do it. When someone offers me money to speak or for a workshop, I donate the money to their um, diversity tickets. So I, I, I fund my own tickets through them, which is great. Oh, hello. Oh, hey, 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 they're finally dogs. Come on then. We've had quite a few super chats, dogs. So you've earned quite a few treats. But be careful, because my, my, my room's full of junk, so be careful. Right, you, come on, one of you, come on. You get one. Good dog. Other one. Come on, Aria, come on. Luna, get out of the way, get out of the way, come on. Hello. Oh, hello, it's one of my kids home from school. Hey, clear off, clear off, get out of here. The dogs can stay, you can't stay, go on, off you go. Can you, can you leave, please, Darcy, darling? I'm, I'm about to finish the video soon. Hey, good dogs. Anyway, so that's your treats. Thanks to all the very generous super chats. Um, the dogs are very hungry dogs, by the way. They like super chats very much. Come on, Luna. Come on. Good dogs. Yeah, good dogs. All right. So, that's the dogs. <laughs> Let's move on to the next question. <laughs> um, oh, yes. Um, books and training. So, I, any money I get from doing any training, I give away to charity um, across the board. Um, that's really, really important for me. You know, when I have enough money to supply my mortgage, my car, you know, get my kids presents for Christmas and so forth, I try and give away as much as I can to charity, which is why uh, Swift for Good existed. That was a huge amount of work to do. But if you go to swiftforgood.com here, this whole book I assembled with a team of 20 people and edited all the text up together. Um, all that money went to Black Girls Code, which is astonishing. You know, it's really, really great for charity. So that, plus the conference, plus the diversity tickets and so forth, any money I get from training just goes away to other charities. So I make zero from training. I just don't do it. Um, I still make money from apps, actually. I made apps years ago, uh, which actually my wife now maintains for me because I haven't got time for it anymore. Uh, and they've paid our mortgage now for eight, nine years, um, which is great. That was a... A good app, that one. <sighs> anyway, thought on SwiftUI for the web. It's a very interesting option. I like the idea. Let's see how it goes. That's all I can say. There's no support for it yet from Apple, so we'll see how it goes. Um, Prathamesh asked about Combine. I have nothing for Combine right now, I'm afraid. Um, Windsnob, do I plan to enable API access? Uh, no, I don't. I could do. I hadn't planned on it, but let's see how we get on. Um, da -da -da -da. Hey, Guy, thank you very much. Yeah, the dogs are so hungry. My dogs never get fed, apparently. <laughs> um, where should you go for advanced Swift UI and Mac OS? Well, there's not a lot to do, really. So, my Mac OS book, Hacking with Mac OS, does come with a uh, addendum for Swift UI. So, it gives you three projects of Swift UI. This book here, uh, as well as AppKit as well. But it doesn't go into advanced Swift UI because at that point it's all cross platform. So that's basically hacking with iOS. You can read that or the 100 Days of Swift UI curriculum. That gives you all the advanced Swift UI you want. It goes into alignment guides, goes to, into uh, accessibility, goes into core data, goes into you know, more stuff. Um, there. The Mac OS bit focuses on how to use the touch bar in uh, Mac OS, you know, the, the unique stuff. You have to worry about how you how do you show windows in Mac OS. So the the guide in there is specifically about the differences between Mac OS and the rest of Swift UI. Same is true of the Watch OS version as well. Um, Piotr asks, have you ever thought about a full time job in some big company? Um, I could do. You know, I I am sure at some point I'd love to work for Apple at some point, and that might happen in, in the future. Who knows? Um, it has to be a company I agree with. You know, so it wouldn't be Facebook, 
it wouldn't be Google. Um, unless Google, well, they're getting better slowly, but it wouldn't necessarily be Google right now. It wouldn't be Amazon for sure. Microsoft, I like, they're a great company. So maybe, maybe in the future. But right now, I'm just having a good time being at home. And you know, it's great because I've got the next five months at home with my kids and I can spend as much time as I want with them because I'm at home. So it's really, really good. Uh, Shinkatsu88, any chance for a medium Swift UI project using coordinator pattern? So I see so many questions about this. How do you use coordinator Swift UI? And I get it. We've used coordinators in UIKit for a long time. It is natural to think, how do I do that same thing that worked before? How do I do exactly that just now in this new thing, Swift UI? And I get that. But it's important to think about the fact that we're not using UIKit anymore, we're using SwiftUI. The problems we had before are not the same problems we have now. The solutions we had before are not the same solutions we want now. And I don't think right now the coordinator pattern is a good fit. So no, I don't think for that uh, at this time. Hey, it's Konas. You arrived rather late. <laughs> I thought, sure, you're at home right now. I thought you'd be at home. You've all, your store's been closed, surely. But I am doing well. I am not currently uh, coronavirus up. Uh, link to the Slack community. It's on the homepage. You click on the homepage and then scroll down. There's a big Slack logo. Press join here. And it'll let you join straight away. Yeah, so Robert, the, the exercises, the little quizzes I do, force folks to stop and read the code very carefully. And they give you sort of comedy mistakes. Uh, and they're trying to catch you out a little bit because I want you to read the code carefully. Um, when you read the code carefully, what will happen is you are basically ingesting the code. You're reading more and more Swift code, more and more Swift UI code until you're used to reading Swift code because you're looking for errors. But your brain's ingesting the code at the same time. So it's a neat little hack to force folks to read the code carefully and in doing so, just subtly sink in the Swift, Swift UI code. Uh... Dogs can stay. You can't stay. <laughs> oh, my dogs are so hungry. My dogs are so hungry. Uh, yeah, they love they love their treats. I'm sure. I'm sure my wife promised me a milkshake. I don't see a milkshake. Anyway, uh, BJ Miller. Yes, it'll be posted later. It'll be on um, GitHub source code and YouTube the live stream. It'll be there. Uh, da -da -da -da. Is it possible to use AV Foundation with Swift UI? Of course it is. It works great in SwiftUI. Brilliant in SwiftUI. No problems. In fact, did I do that in one of the uh, Swift on Sundays thing? I don't remember. I think maybe I did. Forget. But yeah, it works great. There's no problems there whatsoever. Uh, what do I think of the future of Swift in the next two to four years? Looking great. It's looking so, so good. 5.2. 5.2. It's a beautiful release. Um, you know, folks like uh, Slava, like Holly, like Pavel, like... Um, how can I forget his name? <laughs> I want to call his name. Oh no. He's my friend. Oh, my name's just gone out of my head. Codify. I forget his name. I'm being very, very slow. Sorry. I've done wonderful work in really rethinking the way Swift works. And the new diagnostic architecture is a thing of beauty. Your apps compile faster, compile smaller, use less memory, get better errors. Even without the new language features, Swift 5.2 is the finest, best, most astonishing Swift version so far. It's magical. It is the one true version of Swift. The Swift we've all been waiting for. It's so damn good. I love it. And that's why, by the way, I have the tool chain here. So I can switch on. If you hit an error, you make a mistake somehow. I don't know if I'll do it here if I can, I can try it. Better work first time. But anyway, let's try and make an error here. What's it going to do? It's going to. It not even compiles what it's going to do. Cool. <laughs> anyway, um, 5.2, if, if it's made an error, which it's not going to do because it's not even going to build apparently because the Swift is confused. Um, 5.2 would be better at diagnosing the error saying that's the error right there. It's so much better at errors. And so what I do is I write in the current Xcode release, shipping the re release. If I had an error, I just go to the tool chain, put 5.2 on, try it out, spot the error, fix the error, back to the old toolchain again, and it's so very good. Uh, student Ty Leitner, how long do I work? 
honestly, as little as possible. I'm, I'm not lazy, but I'm quite directed. I actually had, I had to update my Switch. I had to buy a uh, 256 gig SD card because I had maxed out my 128 gig. <laughs> and that's, that's how much time I spend playing video games. I'd maxed out my 128 gig game card for uh, Switch. I had to buy a new one, bigger one for my Switch. So I, I'm not lazy, but I certainly, when I'm working, I work very quickly and then stop and nap or play with my kids or play video games or something else. Uh, Yixi, how often am I on Reddit? Uh, often enough that I'm a moderator in R Swift, is the answer. So very often indeed. Uh, Shingetsu, when is Swift on Sundays coming back? Honestly, I don't know. I have no idea. You know, I've got a to-do list that is a mile long. Honestly, it's it's not funny. My to-do list is so very long. And I keep adding to it with more and more things I want to do. And Sundays is currently not on there, so sadly. It's not on there at all because it's quite intense to work towards. Um, I might do it at more of these things, perhaps. These sort of informal, just come along and chat about code on a weekday things. Um, but right now, I hope you appreciate my priority is my family, like everyone else right now. It's a very challenging time. So I don't know the answer. Questions. What's the best resource to learn more about NS operations? So operations. I, you know, I don't know. I don't know. Um, so um, in the book I quoted earlier, Swift for Good, Antoine Van Der Lee wrote a very good chapter on operations in there. I recommend that. Um, and you can start there. There is still... Like the ultimate guide is still uh, Dave DeLong's talk from DubDub on this. It's called like N Advanced NS Operation Q or something. Uh, and it's an excellent talk and it shows how he or him and his team, I don't remember how he did it, built the DubDub DC type app at the time using operations. Uh, and he goes into a lot of good details there. So I recommend that one very much. Also, Dave's awesome. Dave's a very nice guy. Uh, Prathamesh, how can I add the Swift 5.2 tool chain to my Xcode? Um, so imminently, like today, surely Apple today will get Xcode 11.4 released. Currently it's in beta, but that will include Swift 5.2. Until then, you can go to swift.org and uh, download it from there. So here you go. There is swift.org. Press download Swift and then scroll down, find your Xcode release for your Swift version, You'd want 5.2 development for Xcode. It's unavailable right now. Ooh, that was yesterday. Ah, maybe, 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 maybe. It's getting close. Who knows? Um, so maybe they're going to ship 11.4 imminently. Who knows? But I'll have Swift 5.2 in. Until then, get the snapshot uh, and use that. Next question, Patrick, suggestion for tools to use for app store screenshots and app preview videos. Um, so for screenshots, I think most folks use Fastlane because you can basically write your screenshots as UI tests and insert screenshot call points inside there. Um, I do them by hand. I, I sort of carefully create them to be exactly right. Um, kind of a bit, a bit pernickety like that. Um, but I think Fastlane is a good idea, particularly when you have more than one language. So I only have English in my, my app Unwrap, for example. So I only have one set of screenshots, so it's crazy easy to do. Um, but if you have many languages and many devices, you end up with hundreds of screenshots. So I like Fastlane, it's a good idea. Uh, Yixi, just come on here and talk. <laughs> just, just come on here and, uh, and talk for a while about Swift. Or anything, who knows? Um, maybe, yeah. I think folks want to get something out of it. They want to learn something. They want to see something new. They want to try something new. They want some code to look at. Uh, and um, I think that's a, a good idea to have some projects to work with. Maybe we'll do Q and A's, just come and chat for a while. I don't know, we'll see. But uh, honestly, my goal here is to help you folks just feel part of the community. So let me know what works for you and uh, I'll adapt. Um, do I think Swift UI can be used across platform Android development? No, I don't think that at all. Um, how much experience do I have in Mac OS development? Actually, a surprising amount. Um, I love Mac OS development. I love it irrationally much, actually. I've written quite a few apps in Mac OS, and um, they were all in AppKit. I've done a lot of AppKit work in my time. Um, and um, AppKit has its problems. I'm not going to gloss over those. But, you know, for a long time, until, of course, Swift UI, almost every dub dub, Apple will release something for Cocoa for AppKit. 
um, to smooth out the edges. Uh, the El Capitan update was huge, for giving us things like convenience initializers to make things easier to create and work with. And it, it made that get better and better and better and better. And they were slowly getting rid of sales more uh, and making it all view-based. That was awesome. And it was really getting somewhere. Um, and of course, 50 wise thrown most of that out. Um, so I think AppKit will continue to improve, but really think the focus at this point is 50 UI. So even though I have a lot of macOS experience in AppKit, I've got a whole book on it. It's great, great book. I think it's the only book even today on macOS development. And it includes 50 UI as well, by the way. I love AppKit, a lot of AppKit, got a book in AppKit. Um, but the future is currently 50 UI. Okay, any more questions for me? If not, then I will draw a line under today's session and we can move on. CJ, 50 UI. There's your answer. Boom. Raj, how to understand large code bases? Um, that's a hard question. If you're joining a team, where you have people around you, it's obviously much easier because you can just dive in somewhere, ask questions, try things out, take off small bits of work. Um, Control Room isn't that large an app, to be honest with you. It's a macOS app. Actually, someone asked about it. It's a macOS app. Why? It's a macOS app. You're right there. Anyway, um, macOS app using Swift UI. And it's not a big app, to be honest with you. It's quite a small app. But even then, it's quite hard to get into because it's not a very mature app. And if you work, if you work, for, work for a company, if you work for Apple and you work on photos, you look at your Jira backlog or radar backlog for photos, it's going to be pretty long, right? Even though it's a great product, there'll be a lot of things in there to look at, fix, bug fix, whatever in the future. And the best way to get into an app like that is to just take a little bug fix off and do that little bug fix. Learn that bit of the code, then do another bug fix, and another bug fix. And you sort of figure out the code as you go in small little chunks. Um, and we haven't got that in control room because it's not a very mature project. So it's hard to get into. If you try something like SwiftLint, also open source, more mature, has some issues filed, has some feature requests filed, for example, then you'll find that easier to get into. Um, so, yeah. Kevin, uh, uh, I, I, I politely and respectfully completely disagree. I think Catalyst is a brilliant placeholder, but SwiftUI will dominate. Um, Liam, do I have any thoughts on Apple Swift curriculum for students on Apple Books? Um, that was how I learned Swift. Obviously, day one, I read the entire Swift reference guide the day it was announced. Um, quite a few years ago now. Uh, that's how I learned Swift. And it, it works. The team, Dave Addy and friends, did a great job. Um, but it's a reference guide. It's a bit like reading a dictionary. You know, there aren't very many practical examples of putting these things into practice in, in, in a contextual way. So it's hard to learn that way. And again, and again, and again, and again, and again, and again, I see folks saying, um, yeah, if you want to learn Swift, just read the reference guide. It worked for me. And I'm like, great. I'm, I'm glad it worked for you. It will not work for thousands of other people because we all learn differently. Like, so many of my books are project-based. You learn by doing, you learn by building, you learn in context, and that works great for some people, but not everyone. Some folks prefer theory. Some folks prefer the reference guide approach. So uh, we all learn differently, and my way is hands-on, practical, context-driven, and so forth. Other folks will do better with the reference guide. Uh, what I would say is that Mike Stern's team uh, were advertising for a new developer content director last year, and they said they were moving very quickly to build videos and more. And since then, it seems they're building a new platform for developers to do documentation, to handle videos and more. I would expect that what we see with the Swift UI guide today is going to be fundamental to this new platform they're building. Um, and we'll see more. Um, you know, you see, look at Unwrap. My, I, I'm a one one man band. I built an app for iOS teaching you Swift, and it has videos, it has text, it has challenges, it has little badges to earn and ranks and points and gamification. And Apple can totally do that. Apple should totally do that. Please, Apple, do that. Make things more interesting to learn for folks. Everyone can code right now has a pretty big gap in terms of you know here's 
bite the little ca a cartoon alien moving around collecting gems and here's actually building apps. They need to do significantly more. And it's not just, you know, hey, your docs are all saying no overview available. That's true, but they've got to go way beyond that. It's got to be a, not just a small improvement, not even a big improvement. It's got to be a light speed improvement. So I hope that this team, Mike Stern's team, the content director is doing something dramatic. And in some respects, it might put me out of a job. <laughs> They've done such a brilliant job. I'm need, need, not needed anymore at all. Uh, and obviously that would suck. <laughs> um, but I hope it is big. And I, I really, really wish, I really wish, and they won't do this, I really wish Apple would just reach out to me or someone else and say, hey, let's talk. Let's work together. Let's solve problems together. What could this look like? What's your feedback? What experience do you have? You know, I've shown you my numbers on Cloudflare. They're huge. Millions of folks come to my site every single year. Tens of millions. Um, and I would happily contribute to Apple somehow to help, direct, advise, suggest, test, break, whatever. I don't know. But, of course, they won't because they're Apple. <laughs> so, that's not happen. But, anyway, I hope this new thing they're working on is big, is exciting, uh, and is enough to really get us where we need to be. Because right now we're a long way, a long, long way where we need to be. Again, very long answer to a very short question. Crispy, thanks. Hope Beamer arrives soon. So thanks to the world collapsing around us, I ordered a new car, and it's not now arriving until May, um, which is great. So I've got to wait another month and a half until my new car arrives, which sucks. Um, Muaz, would doing a hundred Swift make me a developer? Yes, it would. Of course it would. Absolutely would. Uh, where is native regex on the list of wishes for Swift 6? Um, I really want it, but I don't want NS regular expression because it's old. It's really old. And Python, JavaScript, not JavaScript, but yeah, doing JavaScript actually via libraries, PHP, Perl and similar have all adopted PCRE. They've all adopted PCRE and we're still stuck with manky old regexes. They're not powerful enough. You can't do more advanced things like recursion with them. And it's really frustrating because I want to push regexes hard to do more powerful stuff. Um, so yeah, I wish that in Swift 6 or whenever we get regular expressions, it's not just a wrapper around NS regular expression. Do it properly. Give me PCRE on death, quite frankly. Uh, Chiv688, yes, it'll be online. It'll be a while. Um, it's been over two hours, and what Google will do, unhelpfully, is they'll clip the video so the last two hours are visible first while they process the whole video, at which point they'll do the whole video in a few hours, but it'll be a little while. So give it time. Oh, hey, Ben, how are you doing? Uh, I'm not wearing my NS screencast hoodie today. I'm wearing BitRise. I'm not sponsored, by the way. This is just a, a nice hoodie they sent to me. Uh, although, hey, if you work for BitRise and you want to sponsor me, let me know. <laughs> I'd love to do some uh, BitRise sponsorship. Um, how hopeful about SwiftUI on the web? Would it be a game changer? I don't know. Uh, what I want to see right now is Swift on the web. You know, I want to see WebAssembly, Wasm, uh, with Swift. And it's problematic right now. Wasm isn't fully there to support the features of it. Um, which is a shame because it's really, really good. So I'd love to see that. Rip out JavaScript and have Wasm instead powered by Swift. It'd be lovely. Um, what should I do after I complete hacking with Swift? So it depends where you want to go, Muhammad. Do you, if you want to increase your Swift knowledge, then you want to follow something like Pro Swift. If you want to build better apps, then try one of the advanced Swift books. If you want to broaden your knowledge of app development, you might do design patterns my books for design patterns or testing Swift. Um, if you want to get a job ASAP, you might do Swift coding challenges. What I would say is uh, when you buy the Swift Power Pack, which is my first six books in one bundle at a discounted price, you get an email saying, um, here are you know two or three reading order suggestions. If your goal is to get a job ASAP, do this, 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 and this. If your goal is this, then da 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 da. Um, so it's giving you guidance on what books you might want to read in which order because there are lots of them at this time. So So yeah. Um, Frankenfishdom, do I recommend any Swift playgrounds online? So actually, yeah, I've actually got some. If you go to uh, learn, 
and choose Swift Playgrounds, subscribe to my channel here and you'll get um, Core Graphics Playground, teaching you Core Graphics from scratch and also Swift in 60 seconds. Both through that Playground subscription. Wyatt, you're absolutely right. I mean, uh, Apple has made some beautiful uh, uh, sample code in the past. Uh, like demo bots was huge, huge uh, for doing gameplay kit and pathfinding and similar. And even the smaller one they shipped with the um, collection view diffable data sources this year from um, Steve Breen, who's awesome by the way. Follow him on Twitter. Um, it's a lovely app. They did a they did like an example of sorting of like an array in colors using a, a, a collection view, which is pretty cool. Anyway, they've done great sample code in the past, but they often go down the demo bots approach a massive project which is super cool and super slick and somewhere in there is the three lines of code you want amongst potentially hundreds of files so it's very hard to learn from that uh, which is why when you look at um swift ui by example here this online book i have free of charge again so much free stuff it just solves problems how do i make double tap gestures there's a short video there followed by there's your code that's it. And it's right to the point, solving the exact problem you had for any number of different things down here. So how do I mask views? How do I do custom drawing or make animations or whatever you want to do? Simple question, simple answer. Here's sample code. Here's why it works. Move on. And that's the way my brain thinks. And Apple aren't doing that right now. And one of a thousand ways I'd love to see Apple change. And, and they can't. And they won't. Can't and won't. They won't do either. <sighs> anyway. <sighs> uh... Tesla's, yeah, so Tesla wouldn't work for me because um, I, I can't, my house, I don't live in a particularly massive house. I uh, don't have um, a driveway. So there's no way to park my car. And yes, Ben, Yixi's correct. NS Crinkhouse is down. Heroku is on, on fire. So, um, yeah. Ben, get off here. Solve the problem. <laughs> anyway, um, NS Crinkhouse, by the way, is a very, very good subscriber video stream from Ben Sherman. He's a very smart guy. Uh, and regular videos on Swift and Swift UI and Vapor and more. Go and check it out. Uh, where was I? Yeah, I can't, I can't have Tesla. I haven't got a way to, part, to, to charge it, bluntly. I work from home. I don't drive anywhere to an office to charge my car up. I haven't got a driveway to plug it in from home. So I can't have Tesla, sadly. It's a real shame. Um... <sighs> I don't get your question there, Muaz. Sorry. Uh, Ludwig. No, I've never had a problem with having the back button and having it crash. That shouldn't happen. It's probably an application error on your behalf. Any more questions, or shall I go and try and find this mystical milkshake I apparently have? <laughs> Last chance, folks. I'm going to be signing off in a few minutes otherwise. Thank you all for coming, by the way. It's been really nice having you here. I, I feel good just chatting away, reading your questions. The answer is 325. <laughs> Thanks for that, Siri. <laughs> it's really nice having questions and talking to folks again and just chatting away. And go ahead chatting about uh, Swift again. It's nice. Mister, I also love my website. You don't know why I should make test code. Isn't that covered in the very, very first introduction to the whole book? Like, I, mean, I can look it up quickly here, but I'm pretty sure it was covered very, very quickly in the book why testing is important. Uh, I mean, it's super early on, I'm sure of it. Um, yeah. So yes, I, I was pretty clear on that in the book early on. Um, An answer is because you write code faster. You write tests, you write code faster. As a, as a, um, I can recommend. I'm, <laughs> lots of websites I'm recommending right now. I, my favorite website about um, testing is um, John's blog, QualityCoding.org, um, and he, he's he's Q coding on Twitter. John Reed. Uh, and he's a really nice guy. He does stacks of work about testing. 
he's got a brilliant blog on testing he's got a new book on testing that's launching next month i think all being well um so um i got there a lot and he's got a great quote i actually cite in the book which is that it writing tests gives us the uh, the ability to make bold changes to our code you can rip out this whole method replace it with something else entirely and your tests prove nothing's broken uh, and it's so important to do that. You know, you, you change all the, all the time. You change things, break things, add things, whatever. But at the end of the day, you press test, and it goes through your all your tests, and it all goes green. You know your code's still good. And that's so important. You don't, we aren't worrying about oh no, this might cause massive problems. You know it will work afterwards because you know your tests passed. Get the milkshake, says Patrick. I agree. Where's my milkshake? That's probably the milkshake. Where's my milkshake? I text my wife. Maybe maybe the typo. Where is my milkshake. <laughs> I bet it's a typo. There's no milkshake. She's just taunting me. Um, uh, difference between Swift and SwiftUI for beginners in terms of coding. SwiftUI is much easier and more fun. Uh, Piotr asks, am I going to make a series of algorithms? No, I'm not. I've got a whole book about that called Swift Coding Challenges. We do things like implement sort or um, Floyd cycle section algorithm in the book. We cover what the problem is, I give you some hints to encourage you to solve it yourself, and then walk through solutions. Here's how I'd solve it. And often I provide two, three, four, five, even six different solutions for a single challenge. So you can see, here's one that's easy to remember in an interview. Here's one that's hard to remember, but much faster. Here's one that's very clever. One that, yes. Um, so, I think, ah, brilliant. Ooh, brilliant. Milkshake, it actually exists. <laughs> mm, that is good after talking for so long. Anyway. I explain to people, um, here's an algorithm, here's your job, here's your test cases to apply to make it all works, here's some hints to guide you through, and then here are my solutions. Um, so, uh, yes. Uh, Laporta, yeah, if you're gonna take pot shots at my appearance, you will just get banned. I'm doing my best to answer all questions. If you've got a problem with that, please go ahead and ask someone else. Joe asks for guidance on view models with SwiftUI. So SwiftUI, Apple takes a very different approach to SwiftUI, or what they're saying anyway, which is that your views themselves become their data. And this is very much against the way view models work because your view literally holds its own data. And this can be deeply confusing because some folks like to write very, very large uh, views. And that means having very, very large amounts of data. So um, that's problematic. So if you don't want that, then you've got to split things up to small segments and use the SwiftUI approach. And I, I, I do want to write about that. I want to write about the way SwiftUI encourages us to store data. But I think DubDub this year pretty much guaranteed there'll be a uh, advanced SwiftUI algorithm model talk, something like that. There needs to be really, because we need more guidance. I know what I do. I know it works well for me, but we'll see. Anyway. I think we're almost done here, Patrick. I can I can have a milkshake here and enjoy it. It's from McDonald's of all places. I think my kids on the last day of school have managed to wangle a, a treat from McDonald's. <laughs> just, they're so cheeky. Anyway. Hello, how are you? I'm fine, Talentos. How are you? Stay safe. Wash your hands. Right, any more questions before we are done here? I really do have two straws in my drinks. I want to say, and this is important, these are not McDonald's straws. These are our own home straws. They're plastic straws and they're reusable. So I don't feel guilty having two straws because otherwise um, it'd be bad for the planet having two plastic straws wasted every time. These are super thick reusable straws. so I can use them again and again and again, which is great. Whoa, there's Laporta D calling me useless, and that is Laporta D going to get kicked out. Nice knowing you. You're removed from the channel, and you can just clear off. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Hi, user. So, right, Laporta D, nice having you. If you want to insult somebody else, you can go, go ahead and do that in your own time. All right, folks, I think that's it for all the questions. So um, let me know what you thought of this. Um, leave a comment.
tweet at me, share it in folks uh, on Twitter. Uh, and if folks liked it, I might run some more of these things because they're quite fun. Um, let me know. I'm keen to hear your feedback and do better next time. Otherwise, um, come and see me on Twitter. I am Two Straws on Twitter, hence the uh, Two Straws. Join the Slack channel, post in the forums. You can email me if you want to. I am paul at hackingwithswift.com. There are loads of ways to get in touch with me. I'm sure you'll be fine. Other than that, I will see you next time. Thanks for coming. Thanks for being a nice audience for the most part. And uh, stay safe. Please stay safe. Stay at home if you can. If you go out, you know, for exercise or whatever, stay away from folks. Wash your hands. Stay safe. Don't let the virus spread any further. Take care, folks.